I think of them as um, the Aristotle of the New Age. And there really is no better way of putting it because Aristotle, well, let's put it this way. Steiner is one of those few universal geniuses that Western civilization has produced. And we've only produced really a handful of them. Uh, you can probably count them uh, with all your fingers. And uh, Plato was one, of course, and Aristotle was another, and Goethe, Leonardo da Vinci, and uh, Steiner belongs in that group, along with those men. Now the question is, why doesn't Steiner appear in uh, university school educations if he's as great as all of these other people? And the answer is because Steiner was way, way ahead of his time. <coughs> in a certain respect, uh, he was behind the times, and in another respect, he was uh, at least a century ahead. Uh, he's very popular now uh, in the uh, sort of countercultural uh, world out in uh, the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, California Institute of Integral Studies, for example, they're very fond of, fond of them out there. Um, because what Steiner did was he brought intellect, he brought high German intelligence, the kind of intelligence that the Germans put into everything, you know, from the from the creation of uh, science and quantum mechanics to, you know, the designing of rocket technology. I mean, it's that kind of shrewd, very sharp intelligence, only he brought it to a sharp focus in the sphere of the spiritual energies. And in particular, um, what Steiner did was he had a number of, uh, let's say, the outsider might call them beliefs, but Steiner would say it was knowledge. He didn't have beliefs. These, these were things that he had uh, that he enabled him to see into the, with clairvoyance, into the spiritual world. And things were facts for him which uh, are slowly now we're recovering as facts uh, for the rest of us, such as reincarnation. That was an actual fact for him. In fact, uh, <coughs> the last set of lectures that he gave before he died, he gave a series of about 80 lectures on reincarnation and karma. And what he does is he sort of goes through the history of Western civilization and he looks into the past lives of all the great figures, or at least a handful of them anyway, I shouldn't say all of them, but uh, you know, he'll look into the past life of Goethe or he'll look into the past life of Darwin. Uh, Darwin, he says, was a reincarnated Arab, from the Arab uh, who led the invasion from Africa into Spain in the 8th century AD. And uh, Darwin is the reincarnation of this individual. Uh, Francis Bacon is supposedly the reincarnation of Harun al-Rashid, uh, the great Muslim uh, caliph who was uh, the sort of ruler of Baghdad in the 8th century. So when we start uh, uttering things like this, uh, you immediately lose uh, your audience. Uh, and uh, part of the problem with this is that um, we just don't have any way of verifying these things. Actually, there is an astrologer, a uh, Steinerian astrologer named uh, Robert Powell, <coughs> who's uh, written a book called Hermetic Astrology, who believes he can <coughs> sort of give a verification for these past lives, of uh, these men anyway. Because what he's doing is uh, he's reviving the Egyptian um, heliocentric, uh, apparently this requires a heliocentric ephemeris, and it also requires the sidereal ephemeris because he's shifted into the sidereal system. Now Steiner wasn't much fond, uh, he wasn't much fond of the tropical system at all. Uh, as far as he went into astrology, he was very much into the sidereal, into the whole procession of the equinoxes and every, looking at things with respect to the background of the fixed stars. That's an absolute, uh, he believed that the tropical astrology was a deviation from the true uh, stream that you find even amongst the, the ancients in the West. <coughs> but uh, the curious thing is Steiner dropped a note <coughs> in one lecture you don't hear him talk about astrology much, although as we'll see, his cosmology is, is inherently compatible with astrology. Um, he dropped a note, he said, um, you know, people should pay more attention to the death charts of past, uh, of these people, and then compare what happens, look at where the planets are with respect to the background of, of the fixed stars in a person's death chart, and then look at one of these reincarnated individualities that I've talked to you about, and there will be similar planetary configurations in the birth chart of this individual. So this is a whole new project of research, and Robert uh, Powell has put himself to this task. And he's come up with some really creepy stuff uh, that makes your skin crawl looking at these uh, birth charts. But it has to be a sidereal uh, calculated chart. That's the whole trick of it. And uh, indeed, uh, it's, it's some pretty amazing stuff. So that's Hermetic Astrology, and I'm sort of reading that now. That's my toy for now. Um, but anyway, uh, so. We get these uh, uncomfortable areas that academics just uh, don't care for, not only reincarnation, but you know the belief in uh, this sort of uh, pantheon of angelic beings. Steiner calls them angels, uh, but he also refers to them as gods. He continually says, these are the gods. 
But he basically takes over this hierarchy right here, the, the hierarchy <coughs> of Dionysius uh, the Areopagite. He uses the same basic terminology, except that he renames them, and we'll look at his names that he gives for them in a second. And those are his sort of gods, and he treats them as though they were real beings, and um, indeed they may be real beings. So we'll look at all of that and see what, what happens. Now, with respect to uh, sort of an introduction, I have Steiner's birth chart if anybody wants it. Uh, and I can, uh, I Joyce perhaps can Xerox that for you, whoever wants it. Um, he was born in 1861 and died in 1925. And uh, <clears throat> he was born in what is now Croatia. It was a little village there at the time. So. Uh, his parents were German-speaking, so we have this curious mixture of a, a kind of Slavic inheritance along with the, the German inheritance. I think he was right on the border of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, or what was to be that, and um, <clears throat> was born and was sort of raised in the countryside. Uh, his father was a railway uh, engineer, a station master, I believe, and uh, they sort of uh, lived out in the wilderness for like the first seven years of his life, sort of out in the forest. And they had this station there. So the early imprints on him were the sharp contrast between the dark, Germanic, brooding forests that have produced so many of these German geniuses. Apparently, there's some relationship there between those murky forests and the murky depths of German thinking. Somehow, uh, there is a relationship between the land and the, and the people that springs out, out of it. Uh, the whole sunny disposition of you know, Italy and France uh, has a lot to do, I think, with the climate and sunshine of the Mediterranean, whereas the dark, introverted uh, Germanic world has produced these introverted geniuses. Something about that oppressive, compressive, brooding environment just produces this natural tendency to inwardness, apparently. So anyhow, we have, we're dealing with this sort of impression between these great forests and this, technolo this technology that's coming along, the railway. and. Um, at about the age of seven, he says he had uh, he was sitting in a uh, he was sitting in the station and he witnessed a ghost. The ghost of a dead relative came to him, and he said that was uh, his first enunciation that um, he could see into the spiritual world. And he noticed the curious fact that he was the only one who seemed to be able to do so. And he always felt very isolated, very alienated. That he could see into the spiritual world, and whenever he would bring these things up, even in Germany at this time, uh, people would just shout him down and dismiss him and change the subject and so forth. So he had this problem all of his life. And um, he started out wanting to be a good old respectable German academic scholar. And so, you know, he went through the university system, although uh, his father initially sent him to a technical school rather than the normal uh, gymnasium where he would have gotten a full uh, education in the humanities. So he actually started out with a technical education, then later shifted into the humanities. And um, as time went on, uh, he sort of hooked up with the whole uh, German culture world. In particular, he started out uh, as an editor of the works of Goethe. And at the time, Goethe had fallen out of fashion as a natural scientist. Uh, Goethe was thought of as this great uh, you know, poet, the author of Faust, and all these great works of literature, but you couldn't take him seriously as a scientist. Well, Steiner, on the other hand, took Goethe very seriously as a scientist, and uh, he regarded Goethe's uh, entire way of looking at the world as compensatory in many respects to the Newtonian vision. Goethe had a color theory that was completely the opposite of Newton's color theory, and he had this wonderful theory of the metamorphosis of plants, which uh, I can walk through sometime if you'd like. It's just an absolutely amazing look at the uh, sort of spiritual platonic idea of plantness and what it is what we mean when we say there's a plant and there's a plant. What is it that they all have in common? And he sort of looked at that and gave sort of life cycle of the metamorphosis of plants. And uh, Spangler actually takes his model for the development of high civilization from Goethe's plant model, as we'll see. And um, so Steiner studying Goethe. <coughs> Goethe uh, also uh, discovered the inner maxillary bone, which is a bone uh, that human beings were thought not to have, but all other animals had, and that was regarded as one of the cleavages in the evolutionary model that couldn't be accounted for. And Goethe looked more closely, and he was able to find this bone in the human skull, which kind of continued, made, uh, connected the human to the, to the sort of animal world and further paved the way for the evolutionary theory. <laughs> and he had these different theories of meteorology and mineralogy. He was just a, a universal genius. Um, a lot of people sort of regarded him as a dilettante in this respect. But um, 
Steiner thought otherwise. So Steiner starts out, and he's only 21, 22 years old, and he's editing these works, and he publishes his first book at the age of 25. Uh, probably that would be Uranus, trying Uranus. Um, so many of these German geniuses publish right around 25, 26, their first books usually, right on that Uranus trine. And um, that was a little text on Goethe, Goethe's conception of the world. And then he publishes, you know, his writings and lecturing, and um, he's living in Vienna. And then right about 1890, um, he's done with that project. It sort of dries up, and he moves over to Weimar, where he picks up the editorship of a magazine, which was a general literary periodical uh, that had nothing to do really with any of his interests, but he picked up this experience as an editor. And um, meanwhile, though, you know, he's living in this world and, and dealing with Germany at this time was the place to be if you had any intellectual interest whatsoever, because <coughs> scholarship was really invented by the Germans in the 19th century. From Goethe, Goethe's dates are 1749 to 1832. And it's in Goethe's day, Goethe and Schiller, and then uh, they're followed by uh, you know, Kant and uh, Schopenhauer and Hegel. All these great German philosophers, they sort of reinvent philosophy, that whole group. There's philosophy before them and philosophy after them. And um, the Germans just sort of reinvented it. And part of the way in which they did it uh, had to do, although this comes after Kant, with Schopenhauer's discovery of the Upanishads, and the Germans were the ones who discovered the wisdom of the Orient. They sort of brought it over, took it seriously, started translating the texts. And um, although the first texts were French translations. But uh, Schopenhauer was so enraptured with the Upanishads that uh, he did exactly what uh, Plotinus' teacher Ammonius Saccas had done, a uh, synthesis of sort of Plato, Aristotle, and the, Hind and the Hindus. And what you get there is the world is will and representation. And uh, Nietzsche picks it up from Schopenhauer. Schopenhauer is Nietzsche's idol. And in addition to Wagner, and he meets Wagner, and, and Wagner has, you know, Wagner's operas. Again, you can't understand really Wagner's operas without understanding Schopenhauer the way in which you can't really understand Renaissance painting without understanding Plotinus. It's a translation into art of a specific uh, high conceptual system. And um, Nietzsche was absolutely enraptured by, you know, Wagner. So he writes The Birth of Tragedy, and that comes out in 1872 which is this wonderful uh, peon to the greatness of German culture and how Wagner's reinvented opera and given it a whole new life cycle. Several years passed then, and uh, Nietzsche reconsiders Wagner, and uh, then he begins to think of Wagner as representing actually the end of German culture and the end of classical music. And he says, uh, you know, the Germans take themselves too seriously, and everything that's wrong with German culture, everything that the rest of the world sort of caricatures us as being introverted, broody, uh, taking ourselves too seriously, all of that is what's wrong with Wagner. Uh, you know, tr contrast Carmen, uh, Bizet's Carmen, or, uh, you know, Mozart's operas with Wagner, and you'll see what I'm talking about. There's no laughter in here anywhere. And uh, <clears throat> so uh, Nietzsche lost friendship with Wagner after Wagner wrote Parsifal, which is uh, his attempt to sort of reinvent Christianity, and it's just really, uh, it's, it's absolutely sanctimonious. And Nietzsche couldn't stand it. And uh, then he wrote Human All Too Human, and Wagner read that, and that was the end of their relationship. And uh, then sort of Nietzsche got going, and uh, then uh, the stream moves on. Nietzsche then went insane at about the age of 44, oddly enough, after his sort of Uranus opposite Uranus there. Uh, it would be interesting to look at the transits to his birth chart. But uh, he had this wonderful period of creativity. Um, then he went insane about the age of 44. And Steiner then went to visit him after uh, Goethe, he was sort of done with the Goethe phase. And then he becomes fascinated, this is in the 1890s, with Nietzsche, uh, primarily because of Nietzsche's philosophy of freedom. Nietzsche was, of course, a nihilist. And the nihilistic aspect of, of uh, Nietzsche, Nietzsche did not interest Steiner in the least. But what did interest him was Nietzsche's preoccupation with human freedom. It was, Nietzsche was very emphatic that, um, <clears throat> you know, with the death of God and the death of all of these great systems, we should take advantage of this new freedom and opportunity to reinvent ourselves as humans. And uh, man is an inherently creative being and can establish whatever value system he wants for himself. He doesn't have to rely on gods and angels and so forth. Uh, none of all of that has been discredited. So there's this, you know, the whole Superman philosophy comes out of this rich, creativity that he sort of stands up for and shouts about. And Steiner was fascinated about that because one of Steiner's absolute main focal points is an emphasis that our will is free. And freedom is something that has gradually developed through the evolution of human consciousness. 
It's not something we should take for granted. It's something that has been granted to us, in a sense, in seed form by these angelic hierarchies, but it's something that we've had to sort of earn for ourselves through the evolution of hum human culture. And so it was very important to him. His first, his first sort of significant book is called The Philosophy of Freedom, and it's a, uh, it has nothing to do with these later anthroposophical ideas, but it has to do with that subject of freedom. And um, this came out, I think, in 1894, and he published that, and um, then he sort of goes to visit Nietzsche. And um, he had befriended, I guess, Nietzsche's sister. And um, Nietzsche's sister was thinking, well, he'll do for you know Nietzsche, Nietzsche, all of Nietzsche's unpublished writings, what he'd been doing for Goethe's work. So she wants to sort of take advantage of him in that sense. But he goes in to see Nietzsche. And Nietzsche, of course, is catatonic. And he's sitting there. And he, uh, later on, at the end of his life, uh, he tells the story of his visit of Nietzsche in karmic relationships. And he says, I went in and I looked at him. And he looked like. He looked very peaceful. He was sitting there with his beard, and he was just sort of gazing off into space as though he had just had his morning breakfast and was contemplating his next book. And he had a very peaceful look about him. But he said, you know, I began to sort of see clairvoyantly into the fact that I could see Nietzsche's astral body sort of hovering above him there, sort of thinly connected, very thinly, still connected, but only faintly to the physical body. And then later on, I reflected on it, and I thought about Nietzsche, and I thought about this sense of bodilylessness in Nietzsche. Uh, there's a sense where you know Nietzsche constantly had these migraine headaches, and he had somatic problems. He was always sick with one thing and another. And, um, and then he would do things like he would write while taking his morning walk. He would actually write while walking. You know, He just had this strange sense of not being in his body. And uh, Steiner said, uh, when I did the reincarnation research on uh, Nietzsche, when I sort of saw into the spiritual world of Nietzsche, I realized that Nietzsche was actually this reincarnated monk, a Franciscan monk, uh, back in the 12th or 13th century who had been obsessed with flagellating himself. And uh, that's a little sort of anecdote that he tells about uh, Nietzsche. So that's the kind of thing that we're in for here uh, as we move into Steiner, those anecdotes that will make most academics uncomfortable and will end the conversation immediately. So, uh, so Steiner's developing along, and uh, he decides he doesn't want to do any, any more work uh, about uh, Nietzsche's work. The nihilism probably just turned him off, and the sort of spiritual vacuousness and emptiness uh, in Nietzsche. And then, um, so uh, time goes by, and then he sort of bumps into these theosophists. And, um, now, Theosophy had just gotten off the ground in 1875. Uh, Madame Blavatsky was this Russian woman who had started it. I d actually don't know a lot about it. Um, all I know is that it is very heavily, heavily oriented toward the East. It's sort of presented as a syncretistic uh, kind of uh, synthesis of all the great world religions. And if you look at their symbol and iconography, they draw you know, from the Egyptian Ankh and the Star of David and all this. But they're really heavily leaning toward uh, India. And this was a thing that always bothered Steiner, despite the fact that Steiner did draw from India, as all the great German thinkers were doing in one way or another at this time. But he, in particular, he actually uses lots of Sanskrit terminology, as we'll see. And even in spite of that, Steiner remained a Christian uh, to, the, to the very end, although not an Orthodox Christian. As we'll see, he invented his own myth of Christianity. And uh, it's nothing that any uh, good Christian would ever recognize as properly Christian. But he was very emphatic on this one central point. Christ was a being who had incarnated, was an avatar who had come down from the sun and incarnated once and once only and could never have incarnated again, primarily because Christ is now the spirit of the earth and has sort of transubstantiated the earth into the spiritual vessel. But the problem with that is that theosophists, um, Charles Ledbetter had, uh, in, on the beaches in India, had discovered uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti and his brother Nityananda playing these young boys on the beach, beautiful young boys, absolutely radiant when you look at these early black and white photographs of these children. And the Ledbetter was struck by this, and he decided that Judah Krishnamurti was going to be the next world messiah, and um, put him forth as such. And not only that, but that Judah Krishnamurti in a past life, his last incarnation, was as Jesus Christ. Well, now Steiner wouldn't have anything to do with this. And um, this was always a tension between he and Andy Besant, uh, for a long period of time, although he did go along with, the, despite the tension, he went along with them for a, a good decade, mainly because probably the opportunities that it gave him. I mean, right about 1901, 1902, he starts lecturing to theosophists. 
They like everything that he has to say, and now he has the first opportunity to come out of the closet about spirituality. He doesn't have to worry about being taken serious as, a, as an academic anymore. Those days are gone. He's no longer in the university world. Here's an audience who's willing to listen to ideas about reincarnation, ideas about spiritual worlds and hierarchies, and uh, they just drink it up, and the theosophists love it. And so he founds the German section of the Theosophical Society, and that gets up and rolling, and everything's going along, despite the tensions between he and Annie Besant for a good decade, from about 1901 to about 1912. And curiously enough, he breaks from uh, the Theosophists in 1912 at about the same time that Freud and Jung were splitting up in 1912, interestingly enough. And um, <clears throat> it was over this very issue of, over, over uh, Christian Murdy. That was the, that, the straw that broke the camel's back uh, to rework that cliché. But during this period of this decade, this is when uh, you know, Steiner's just turned 40. Uh, he's on his Uranus opposite Uranus, and uh, he's got these wonderful transits, I think, with uh, he has Neptune conjunct Mercury, which is the spiritual intelligence, and uh, that's being squared by Neptune, I think, at this point. And, um, and uh, he's got Uranus in a T-square with opposite Uranus because he's got Uranus uh, square sun. And so all this stuff is lighting up, and out comes all these brilliant works of, uh, of just genius. Theosophy is the, the first primary text. Anyone who wants to be acquainted with Steiner should start with that text, Theosophy, and then How to Know Higher Worlds where he gives specific exercises on how to begin to develop for yourself these kinds of spiritual training exercises that will enable you gradually, if you're patient and persistent, to attain knowledge of the higher worlds and to, be in, to, to begin to see into these spiritual planes. He believed that everyone possessed these abilities and could cultivate them given the time and patience and persistence, and it was just a matter of learning how to do it. Um, he didn't see, he only saw himself as unique in the sense that this just came naturally to him and always had. But he believed that anyone could be taught to see into the higher worlds, or to see into their past lives for that matter. And uh, so then uh, uh, his sort of Bible is the, uh, published in 1910, The Outline of Occult Science. That's the largest book uh, translated now as Outline of Esoteric Science. And uh, that's the book that contains the creation myth that we're going to go into. Uh, so it's, in a sense, it's a sort of Bible. Although the curious thing about Steiner now is that um, he did all these lectures. And as a matter of fact, once he started lecturing, he never stopped. He lectured almost every day of his life, for the rest of his life. And, uh, you know, he died in, what, uh, 1925, so he was... Uh, 60 something or 1861 to 1925, whatever the difference there is, was in his 60s. But from the age of 40 to that, you know, these last 20 years of his life, he produced, it, it's, your jaw drops. It is unbelievable how much he, he produced. All of these lectures were recorded by, you know, brilliant stenographers, and the, the rates of literacy were different than, then than they are today, and they didn't have tape recorders, but the lectures are very accurate. and. Um, what we have with respect to Steiner is something like over 300 lectures, probably more than that, I'm probably underestimating. There are so many of them. The majority of Steiner's writings consists of these lectures. And so he has these, this handful of written books. And the written books are essential reading, but even more essential, I think, are the lectures, because in the lectures, his guard is down, and the lectures were given directly to anthroposophists, presupposing the knowledge of the basic principles of anthroposophy and you find all kinds of stuff in the lectures that you won't find in his published writings. They're, they're absolutely indispensable. So, um, so we just have volumes and volumes and volumes and volumes of lectures, uh, and uh, no, one, no one person, unless he never read anything else, could ever hope to read all of them. Um, I've probably read something like 30 to 35 of Steiner's books, including the lectures and the, and the basic books, and I still feel like I've only touched the tip of the iceberg. This guy was just amazing. So uh, right about 1910, then, uh, he, the, um, the tensions within the, uh, anthrop the Theosophical Society begin going on, and they break about 1912. The German section really wants to break apart. They put the pressure on Steiner to make the break final, and he had developed this new term, anthroposophy, so that they would now be called the anthroposophists, emphasizing the study of the human rather than the divine so much, more the human than the divine. And, um, this is uh, 1912. And then uh, he starts writing these little things called th these mystery plays. And he, you know, he wants to translate into art his whole uh, system so that they would be, you know, he sort of said, if all of my lectures
structures were burned and if nothing else survived except for these four mystery plays, theoretically you should be able to construct everything I have to say about anthroposophy from these mystery plays. Well, it turns out if you try to read the mystery plays, I've only tried to read one of them, they're quite ridiculous. And um, there's a problem here. It, very often mystics try to be artists and they don't make good artists. And they rarely make that transition into literature. And everything I think that Nietzsche accused Wagner of in his operas goes tenfold for Nietzsche's plays. They're incredibly artificial, very, very uh, sanctimonious, very bombastic, not a, a, a note of humor anywhere in them. And they just kind of come across as being very ridiculous. And I, I didn't even read these things until after I'd been immersed in Steiner for a long time. So it wasn't as though I was this outsider. Um, but it might be a different thing to see them performed on, on stage, I don't know, so we'll leave that. But other than, you know, that's the only negative thing I really have to say about Steiner is these ridiculous plays. Um, but anything, anyhow, the, the key thing is, after these plays are put together, right around 1910, 1911, 12, there's like one play a year, he decides, well, what we need is our own sort of Bayreuth for putting these things on. You know, Wagner had invented Bayreuth as this opera house exclusively to put on his own operas. And so Steiner thinks, well, we need a place where we can perform mystery plays. And not just our mystery plays, but also Goethe's Faust and anything else that has to do with the anthroposophy that we can dramatize on the stage. So he comes up with the idea for building this thing, what he calls the Gertanum. And that's what the building is called, this sort of part of anthroposophy. And he tries to get the building up in Munich. The city officials won't have it. Um, so then he, he has the good fortune to come across a piece of property in Switzerland. And remember, Young was out in Switzerland at this time, and later, as we'll see, Gene Gebser arrives here uh, much later on, a couple of decades later on. This is in Dornach in uh, Switzerland. And uh, he comes across this piece of property, buys it, and they lay the foundation stone, and they start building the Britannum. And I have a couple of pictures of it we can look at. It's an absolutely gorgeous building. I mean, it was brilliant. And he himself designed the building. Instead of doing a traditional thing where the architect would draw the plans for it, what he did was make, uh, he, he was a sculptor, so he made a scale model of it. And they built it based on the scale model. And it's absolutely gorgeous. And it's, it's a very unique looking building. But they made the mistake of building it in wood. And Steiner, uh, as time went on, accumulated enemies. Um, and there are theories that uh, the early incarnation of the Nazis uh, grafted onto him and burned down the building. The burning burned, uh, burned down in 1920, on the, New Year's Eve, 1921-22, the whole thing. And as you can imagine, he was very crestfallen about it, but it uh, didn't seem to stop his output. He just kept right on pouring out these lectures and, and incredibly busy man. And they set about the building of the next Gertanum, which now is there uh, uh, on the same site, built, which is built out of concrete. So no one's going to burn that down. And it's a, it's a kind of forbidding fortress-looking thing, whereas the original Gertanum was light and elegant and organic. It looked like a, a living plant. The new building kind of looks like a concrete bunker, a kind of giant fortress. So it's, it's very aggressive-looking. But anyhow, so that's where the center is now for anthroposophy, the Gertanum in uh, Switzerland. So meanwhile, um, he's doing all of these things, rewinding back to you know 1910. Uh, World War I breaks out in 1914. And he had been giving all of these lectures on Christianity. His, his myth of the incarnation of Christ is worked out um, between 1908, 1909 is the crucial period, 1910. Then World War I breaks out, and he said, the spiritual world suddenly closed to me. And I could no longer see into it with respect to these Christian events. And suddenly now I had to see what was going on with respect to what was happening in the spiritual world to bring about World War I. And later, as we'll see, he said one of the prime causes was the fact that around the middle of the 19th century, the Archangel Michael had been involved in a war in heaven. And there was this gigantic battle with these certain spirits that Steiner calls Aramonic beings. And Aramonic beings are the beings that are possessing us right now because Araman is the god of matter. It's the god that uh, tries to convince us that there is no such thing as spirituality and that all there is is matter and machines. And these Aramonic beings were sort of cast out of heaven. Uh, Michael was victorious. They were cast out of heaven and then they wandered up onto the earth uh, and throughout the 19th century looked for uh, the souls of men to possess them and sort of possessed and infected them. And World War I was the beginning of the outbreak of this new drama where there's an enormous danger in the 20th century and it has not been decided which way we're going to go here. Are we going to go the way of the Aramon experience and get captured and caught by our technology? And this is exactly what I think has happened. Um, 
Or uh, the opposite god to Ahriman is actually another bad god called Lucifer, but Lucifer represents um, the temptation toward pure spirituality. He tries to tempt man into believing that he's only a spiritual being and that matter is illusory. It's a little bit like the, uh, the uh, eccentricities of the Hindu system when they're at their worst, sort of denying everything is maya, nothing's real. So Lucifer is the opposite. Uh, and in between them is the perfect balance is between them is the perfect balance is represented by the Christ being who represents this balance. He did this uh, great sculpture of uh, Christ between uh, Lucifer and Aramon, and Aramon is represented down below as this kind of rock mineral formation thing, with Lucifer up above as this sort of cloud-like being, and then the Christ being standing by the side of them, representing the balance between the spiritual world and the material world, which is the proper balance for the human being. We have to find that balance, and not like the Hindus fly off into spirituality and leave the physical world, and not as we're doing in the modern day, forgetting about the spiritual world altogether and just becoming caught and, sw and swallowed up by sort of technology. So uh, he recognized this danger and he said he recognized that World War I was the beginning of this, of this outbreak and that he recognized there was a real challenge for contemporary man in the 20th century here. So then uh, World War I passes and uh, he goes back to sort of doing his activities, but now as he enters into the sort of final phase of his life, uh, a new kind of pragmatism comes over him, and people start approaching him, and they're asking him for things like, what do you have to say about education? He thinks about it, he says, okay, here's my idea. Gives a few lectures on it. The Education of the Child was published, had been published in 1907, so we already had a basic theory of education. And they found the Waldorf schools. So the Waldorf schools, and they're found all over the world, uh, are a direct application of Steinerian teaching to uh, the elementary school level. And it's just based uh, on these three phases of the child from 0 to 7 is taught in a certain way, then from 7 to 14 is taught in a certain way, and then from 14 to 21 is taught in a certain way. And each one of these is different because there are these different developments at each of these phases. And apparently it's very successful. Uh, the Waldorf education emphasizes the arts and, and, and uh, grounding the child in something that is much needed today, particularly in the day of the, you know, uh, these days that our children are being, you know, sort of uh, um, captured by uh, technology through video games and electronics. But here they teach the children, they give them, they teach them how to paint, sculpt, draw, uh, how to play a musical instrument, they teach them myths and tales and legends, all of this stuff which could, from a certain point of view, be regarded as regressive, as sort of, well, that's the way culture used to be. And in fact, that's true. That's the European approach. That's the classical approach. The American approach is technolog technological. Uh, you know, the, America, the difference between the Americans and the Europeans is very analogous to the difference between the Romans and the Greeks, between the Babylonians and the Sumerians, between the Aztecs and the Mayan. That is to say, as we'll see when we look at Spangler, the late phase of these great civilizations always ends up in this very dark, sort of heavy, harmonic Steiner would say materialism with an emphasis on pragmatics, technology, and a loss in the arts and a forgetting of uh, what being human is all about. All of the civilizations that we mentioned, the Babylonian, Roman, Aztec, represent decadent versions of the earlier uh, inspired lyrical civilizations. And so we as Americans, I think, find ourselves in a position that is, uh, is, that is not unprecedented, but it has a precedent in that respect. Um, so anyway, so uh, then he sort of gives, starts giving these lectures on uh, medicine, and he starts developing his theory of anthroposophical medicine. And uh, you attract certain people to him who are very much interested in this, and anthroposophical the psychical medicine is now being practiced. You'll find it, uh, it's a very unique and interesting holistic approach to treatment. Uh, there's a certain way to approach cancer. There's a certain way to approach the whole mind-body relationship. And uh, it's done, uh, it's, it's very fascinating. Birds won't come to eat the worms. So the birds are gone. And then you get Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. Where are the birds, you know? And uh, Steiner sort of foresaw all these ecological interconnections in nature. And so he laid the basis for biodynamic agriculture. And he was just an incredible genius uh, ahead of his time here. And as I said, the Aristotle of the New Age in, in many, many ways. He saw everything that has been picked up by the New Age and the counterculture since the 60s. It's all there in Steiner. Um, in fact, what led me to Steiner was actually, after writing this book here, Twilight of the Clockwork God, I specifically went looking for people who were smart and intelligent, who had things to say about things that I wasn't certain were true, but I wanted to hear somebody smart talk about them, like astrology, 
uh, so I interviewed Rick Thomas. Uh, or, you know, mind-body medicine, so I interviewed Deepak Chopra. Or, uh, you know, reincarnation, so I interviewed Rupert Sheldrake and Stan Brock. I wanted intelligent people representing these viewpoints, but what I didn't realize was all of that was in Steiner. Steiner's whole worldview represented the cosmology that I was looking for in that book, going to these individuals who each sort of, you know, they're bright guys and everything, but each one of them had this uh, sort of one good idea, whereas Steiner is just this bounteous, you know, cornucopia of ideas, all these things flowing out of them. Uh, it's just unbelievable. So uh, in many respects, um, I had not read Steiner when I wrote that, and had just started reading him as I was concluding it. And uh, so uh, I've sort of been preoccupied with uh, the whole Steinerian vision as a result of that. And so that's what we'll, uh, we'll begin to look at now. And then, as I say, Steiner died in uh, 1925 after this uh, prodigious uh, creative output. And, uh, you know, by their fruits ye shall know them. And Steiner's fruits are enormous in this world. He's had an enormous, it's one thing, you know, to have, to be a sort of brilliant metaphysician, you know, and be brilliant and have people read your books. It's another thing to have these things, you know, being applied to medicine and agriculture and a theory of education. And not only that, but there's a curative education that's directed specifically toward uh, mentally challenged individuals that Steiner developed. In fact, uh, he, early on in his career, had taken up, while he was doing the editing of Goethe's writings, had been asked to, he was tutoring, to bring in some extra money, and he was tutoring a certain family who had four sons, and one of the sons was hydrocephalic, that is to say, had water instead of a brain. And um, hydrocephalics are generally dismissed as, you know, backward and incompetent, but Steiner was patient with this child, and over a period of about two years, taught the child, taught him how to read, got to the point where later the child went on to become a medical doctor. So, um, you know, we're dealing with an absolutely competent human being here. And uh, so that's what I want to, that's my sort of introduction uh, to Steiner. And uh, a couple of strange points about him, you know, just to, to sort of counterbalance our hagiography. I don't want to, I don't believe that anybody's perfect or as an avatar or anything like that. There are rumors that Steiner was a closet homosexual, that um, he married these women who were, uh, he had one marriage uh, that didn't work out, and she left him the moment he started to get interested in the uh, Theosophical Society. She just wouldn't have anything to do with it. Then the second woman uh, comes in, and she's about 12 or 13 years older than he is, and she was really more of a mother figure than anything else. Uh, there are rumors that she dressed him, she picked out all of his clothes, you know, he always looks immaculate in these pictures. She dressed him, and she was really a woman figure. And um, you don't hear him talk much about love and sex. This is one subject that you don't hear him talk about. And I find that curious in this vast cosmological vision where he talks about everything under the sun but the genitals. They're mysteriously absent. I mean, of course, this is, you know, we're just coming out of the Victorian epoch, and there are certain things that are proper to talk about. But he wouldn't even talk about, you know, male and female relationships. I mean, whereas Young was very much at the time, you know, the mystery of the male and female relationships was his primary central thing. So that is, that is conspicuous. So he may have been a closet homosexual who just, uh, uh, you know, didn't give himself permission uh, for fear of what would happen to follow that route. And all of his significant relationships were with men, uh, I think. Whereas Young's, most of Young's after Freud were with women, uh, as an interesting aside. So he, he was not a perfect uh, human being by any means, but um, in, any, in any case. So let's, let's sort of start by looking at uh, the, the key thing to start with in Steiner. Is this um, theory of the architecture of the subtle body? And you really can't understand anything else until you get this, this one aspect straight. And then once you understand that, everything else comes out of that. And this the architecture of the subtle body. And what this is is a sort of adaptation from the Hindus, of, uh, from the Vedanta system specifically, of this idea of the sheaths that surround the soul. And the, you know, the Hindu model of it is um, you have the soul. And the Hindus probably got this from the Egyptians, I think, but it's a good bet. You sort of have the soul as this monad, and it's surrounded by this, let's say, a, this sort of lotus. And this is the, what the Buddhists say when they say the jewel in the lotus. This is what they're talking about. The soul in the lotus of matter 
is the soul within the body, and as these petals, you know, enfold around it, you can sort of peel them back, and each one of these represents one aspect of the subtle body until you peel it all the way back and you get to the core nucleus of the jiva, or the purusha, the monad that is immortal and indestructible. Or in uh, classical Hinduism, it's the Atman, which isn't so much a monad as the metaphysical mystery that we're incarnating within each one of us that's identical with, you might say, Brahman, the absolute transcendental ground of being. Okay, so then the trick is, what are these lotuses? What are, these, what are, the, what are the different petals? And um, the first of them is known as the Anamaya Kosha. This is the Hindu system, not Steiner yet. Um, this means sheath made out of food. Sheath, kosha, made, maya, out of food, ana. That's the physical body. We are all food sooner or later for something else that's alive. Everything eats everything else. And so the body that we're, the physical body is itself going to become food uh, for the worms, you know, and bacteria and so forth. So that's the anamaya kosha. And that, as we peel that back, the next layer inward is the pranamaya kosha, which is the sheath made of prana. And prana is simply, as you know, it's chi. It's the vital forces. It's uh, uh, the invisible structural meridians through which the breath channels uh, and um, all the vital energy is stored up there. And if that gets disturbed, then you're in for an illness. Um, so that's the sort of pranamaya kosha. And then bound up with that is the monomaya kosha, which is the sheath made of mind. So all these three are intimately intertwined with each other as the sort of physical and etheric body. The monomaya kosha is the mind, the sort of lower mind that's, uh, you know, when you're suffering, when you're in health, when you're in poor health, uh, you know, an accident happens or whatever, something bad happens to the food chief, the monomaya kosha says life's not worth living. You know, it's stuck in, in being involved with the outer body. And if anything happens to that, you know, you get the Schopenhauerian pessimism where Schopenhauer comes in and says, life was a, you know, quite evidently a mistake. Anyone who looks about it and thinks about it rationally, uh, it's just a mistake. The whole thing is a cosmic mistake. It's rooted in this will that brought everything into being, but the, the will is totally irrational. But you see, that's the problem. When you look at life with the Manamaya Kosha, it is something that doesn't make sense. That's why it has to be looked at from deeper levels. Well, life is not a rational problem at all. It's a rapturous, uh, bounteous pouring forth of forms, and it has nothing to do with what happens to the forms. It's the fact that they're being created to begin with. You know, you mow down the grass every uh, Sunday, and it just grows right back up again. It doesn't say, you know, forget it. What's the use? It keeps on. It keeps coming back. <laughs> so uh, then we have the deeper wisdom that is the goal of yoga, is sort of to connect these outer sheaths to these lower two which are the Vijnanamaya Kosha, which is the sheath made of wisdom. And Vijnana can also be pronounced uh, Vijnana. Um, the Vijnanamaya Kosha is the sheath made of wisdom, and that's what's bringing the grass up all the time. That's what brings all the trees up, all the plants, all the flowers. That's what uh, drives the sexual energies. That's what drives everything to come into being to begin with. And it's absolutely relentless. There's no stopping this thing. You can drop atom bombs everywhere around the world, and It'll be repopulated again, despite the misery, you know, in, in no time at all. It, this thing just doesn't care what, what's going on out here. Uh, the goal is just to keep producing forms. And um, so no matter how miserable life gets, uh, there will always be this, this reproductive mystery. And the sexual energies are rooted in this. It, it just doesn't matter what happens to the forms in the outer world. And the myths come out of this. Myths come out of the wisdom body because myths are these uh, visions that come out of the wisdom body whose job is to reconnect the, the alienated monomaya kosha back to the wisdom of being. Um, so myths are messages that, shift, that uh, relate us to the preconditions for living. And then the final one of these is uh, the ananda maya kosha. And ananda, of course, means bliss. And that's it. That's the, that's the, you're rooted in rapture. That's the ultimate transcendental ground within us. That's the primary thing that is. You are rooted in rapture beneath all of these outer layers of suffering. And, you know, this is what the, those Buddhist monks who had lit themselves on fire during the Vietnam protests, they, they were just jacked right into this level, the Ananda Maya Kosha. And once you're in that level, if you can bring the Ananda Maya Kosha down into that level and keep it there, you can endure anything. Whatever happens to you can be endured. And so that's the 
sort of pragmatic. Uh, this is the Vedantic system, and uh, Steiner's system is a kind of translation of this, but not. it doesn't map on exactly. So his subtle bodies go, um, if we sort of look at them this way, we can say uh, the physical body is the first sort of sheet. This corresponds to the Anamaya Kosha. The physical body, according to Steiner, is what we have in common with the mineral world. As soon as you're dead, the body is returning to the mineral world. It's returning to the inorganic world. So it is that element that we have in common with that world. And we're constantly taking in minerals and nourishment from the inorganic world and transforming them into life. Uh, once that process is over, you're back to the mineral world. You know, the skeleton is primarily just a mineral. Um, so the physical body. Then we have the etheric body, which is the next one in, which corresponds to the pranamaya kosha. Um, the etheric body is what we have in common with plants. And the presence of an etheric body is what differentiates the plant kingdom from the mineral kingdom. Anything that's alive has an etheric body. That's the precondition. Uh, you know, you can say anything that has cells has an etheric body. Uh, and what an etheric body is, is it's just the, the, it's responsible for the growth and nourishment of the body, for its metabolic processes, for the shaping and forming of the body. And when there are disturbances in the etheric body, that's when you get illnesses. Um, and when the etheric body leaves the physical body, the, the physical body dies. Steiner has this uh, bizarre thing where he says, you know, if you ever feel your arm falling asleep, um, what it is is that the etheric body has partially and momentarily separated from the physical body at that moment. Um, and then he says, uh, well, well, we'll look at that in a second. Um, so the physical and the etheric, and then uh, the next uh, one in is the astral body. Now the astral body is what we have in common with animals. And the presence of an astral body is what differentiates animals from plants. And what that is is simply the faculties of passion and desire, the desire to sort of reproduce, everything that drives an animal to experience pleasure and pain. So the basic pleasure-pain thing uh, is what is central to the astral body and what's moving the animal world in contradistinction to the plant world. Plants are just sort of there living in this... Uh, now, he does correlate these with the Hindu uh, levels of consciousness uh, where he says the physical body... Where he's, well, first let's say... where he says the etheric body corresponds to deep, dreamless sleep. And so plants are just sort of locked into the state where they don't... They don't dream, but they're in this, in this sort of eternal twilight state where they're just, you know, there, and they experience this sort of there-ness. Whereas the astral body corresponds to dreaming consciousness. You know, animals dream, but plants don't. Dreaming consciousness. And then the fourth is the presence of the ego, which will correspond to waking. And the sort of mineral world is just corresponds to, you know, a duller type of consciousness that's even duller than deep dreamless sleep. Um, now, this whole thing about the ego in Steiner, it's important to differentiate this from Jung's ego because it's not the same thing. If you sort of take Jung's idea of the ego and take it together with the self, then you have what Steiner's talking about by the presence of an ego. Whereas the astral body gives consciousness, the ego gives us self-consciousness. And the presence of self-consciousness is something that the human world has that none of these other kingdoms have. So this, this ego thing is a very large thing. It's not as specialized as it is in Jung and Freud. And it's the spiritual monad that undergoes reincarnation, the ego does. And the animals don't have this. Um, they share kind of group souls. Uh, <coughs> so this is a thing that's transmigrating from lifetime to lifetime. And there's a sort of lower ego and a higher ego. The lower ego is more involved in the, in the body and the flesh. And the higher ego is the one that needs to awaken towards spirituality. It's so very similar to uh, the uh, Neoplatonic doctrine of reason and um, the use, the higher reason, the transcendental, you know, gaining control of the passions and so forth. So that now the key thing then in Steiner is that the ego has to gain control of these lower functions. And this is a difficult task. Uh, the gaining control of the astral body is, is almost a natural part of just maturing. I mean, um, Gaining control of your passions and desires is something we normally associate with maturity. Uh, teenagers have less control over their astral bodies than adults do. So there's a certain amount where this process unfolds naturally. 
But uh, even further beyond that, the ego can gain control of the astral body and not just gain control of it, but uh, there are certain exercises that can be done that will develop it. Uh, and certain exercises that will then develop the etheric body, and the etheric body has to do uh, not only with the formative forces, but also with deep-seated things like character, temperament, deep-seated habits. As we'll see, the etheric body also has to do with things that have to do with habit, memory, routine. They, get, they sink into the etheric body. So the etheric is lower than the astral. And the astral can imprint things on the etheric and teach the etheric things. And the etheric will then shape the physical body. So we have a key here to how yoga works. What the yogis are doing is they're sort of shaping these bodies. They're teaching, getting control of the astral body and teaching it to shape the etheric body. And then they can do these miracles with their physical body. Um, so then Steiner recognized all of this. So it's very compatible with uh, the Far East in many, many respects, but also very different. So this is the sort of key thing. These four sheaths are the most essential thing to understand in Steiner because everything will unfold out of them. And uh, this is the sort of fourfold model, but now he has a, uh, a sevenfold model. So there's a sevenfold model and a ninefold model. And let's see. Let's see. The uh, sevenfold model, if we put the ego up here, and we say that um, there's even a threefold model because man, uh, the human being is body, soul, and spirit. And so these three represent body. They all have in some respect to do with the physical, and then we'll have soul, and then spirit. And that is a trifold being. Whereas Jung will always emphasize fourfoldness, Steiner is still locked into the trifoldness. So you're always going to see these repetitions of threes in, in Steiner. Um, the physical body has a higher spiritual seed within it that can be sublimated and can grow out of it. terms are awkward, but that's this how they're translated into Eng English. I suspect the German is more profound. Um, so the physical body has a spirit body seed that can be brought into perfection. The, light, the etheric body has a life spirit that can be brought into perfection, and the astral body has a spirit self. And he uses Hindu terminology for this. He says uh, the spirit self is manas, the life spirit is the buddhi, and the spirit body is atma. The way he uses these terms have actually little to do with the way the Hindus use them, so it's, they're, they're just good to identify because sometimes the translators will change these. As long as you have the Sanskrit term, you know what the translator's talking about. So they're good to keep in mind just for that reason. So the task of spiritual initiation is something in the center that, does, that is unfolding epically in terms of the destiny of the human race. We're, we're gradually unfolding these sheaths. Uh, right now, we're in the stage of the ego that's being unfolded. Northern European civilization is developing the ego in a way that, and to an intensity and degree that it has never been developed before in history. And in the future, man will move on into these higher stages, as we'll see in his evolutionary model, naturally. But individuals can, if they choose, also move in this lifetime into these areas. Once this is achieved, reincarnation will stop just as it does in the Hindu system. Um, the whole goal of reincarnation is the gradual perfection of these lower bodies into these upper spiritual bodies. So if you choose, you can apply what Steiner calls spiritual science or initiation, uh, and we'll look at a couple of those exercises, toward these lower sheaths in order to bring them into perfection. It takes a long time to do it. It's very concentrated, very patient. He outlines all of this in uh, How to Know uh, Knowledge of the Higher Worlds, or How to Know Higher Worlds. That's the book you want to read if you want to see all the details. Uh, we won't get too much into the details. Because there are areas of it that I don't understand. Steiner's very difficult in, a, in uh, trying to understand every little thing. It's, it's very difficult. I can get the structural sense of this, but some of the uh, connotations escape me. Um, so we have those. And then uh, with respect to the soul now, that's the sevenfold model of the human being. Three, three, seven. But now he says, um, 
There are three aspects of the, the ego as well, slash soul. The soul is the ego. And each one of those has a unit, a sort of component that is linked to these other three. We have um, the uh, sentient soul, which is the one that's closest linked to the astral body. The astral body is the vehicle that enables us to perceive things. When you're in uh, the life between death and birth, you're in bardo, you still have the astral body and that enables you to perceive all the gods and, and divinities and beings. When that crumbles and disintegrates, you can no longer see anything. So the senses are linked with the astral body. And, uh, but now the sentient soul is something that differentiates out of it and it has to do with sort of pictorial imagery, um, as we'll see. And then the etheric body has a uh, intellectual or mind soul. The intellect sort of differentiates out of the etheric body, and the reason that it does that is because the etheric body has to do with memory. And you can't learn anything without memory. So, uh, as he'll say in his model of, of uh, infancy and the development of the child, he'll say, you generally don't want to teach children to read before the age of seven. And that disagrees with our sort of theory of, you know, five, throw them into kindergarten and get them going. He says, the reason you don't want to do this is because the etheric body is still working on the child's physical body. And it doesn't come to maturity, the etheric body, until the age of seven. And that's Saturn, square Saturn. Uh, uh, Saturn's life cycle model, as we'll see, nicely fits into the seven-year Saturn cycle. Um, at the age of seven, the child loses its teeth. And that's the signal that it's changing, and the hard teeth come in, and the etheric body is done. It's ready now to be freed and used for other things. Because at that point, it's done shaping the human physical body, and now it can be freed up for the development of the child's memory. So this is why around the age of seven, the child begins to acquire faculties of memory that it didn't have before, because now the etheric body is freed up and can be used. So then you can start che teaching uh, children how to read and uh, how to learn to remember things. So this is how the mind soul will differentiate out of the etheric body. And then we just have the consciousness soul that comes out of, sometimes this is translated as spirit soul, but that's confusing because it just links over with spirit although it is the one that's most closely linked to the spirit. The consciousness soul is the highest of these three souls, whereas the sentient soul is the lowest. It's bound to the astral. The consciousness soul is the highest, and it's linked to the next phase over the spirit body. And the consciousness soul uh, is actually the epoch of civilization that we're in. Steiner says since about, you know, since 1413 AD, uh, we've been developing the consciousness soul as a species, you know, as a, well, as a, as a uh, you know, northern European civilization has specialized in developing the consciousness soul. And the way in which that works is the consciousness soul really has to do with the sense of the I, the ego, the sense of freedom that goes along with that and the will. And the will comes up out of the physical body. So that, let's say, the difference between these three is, let's say, I'm looking at the outer world and I'm perceiving things with, with my sort of sentient soul. And let's say I turn away from that and I start thinking about what it was I was perceiving. Now I'm using the mind soul. And then let's say that after I've thought about it, I decide that I'm going to act on things. Now we're in the consciousness soul. So the consciousness soul brings the will into effect. It acts on the data given to the senses. So the consciousness soul has more to do with the will, and it has to do with freedom. And Northern European civilization has really developed this sense of freedom and free will. And this is why I think astrology dropped away, because the early version of astrology was too deterministic. The astrological vision that we inherited from the ancients was a very deterministic system, although there were ways of breaking out of it. And in fact, the old initiation mysteries consisted in gaining freedom from the stars through initiation in the mystery cults. But um, I think astrology dropped out because of uh, this emphasis on this new aggressive uh, Faustian uh, freedom and the sort of conquest of the earth with our machines. We didn't want any stars telling us what to do. So now as astrology returns, and it is returning, we have to sort of sort of ref reflect upon uh, how does this work with respect to freedom of the will. Um, and in Steiner, actually, the, the sort of dichotomy is, although he doesn't have astrology, he has karma. And he has this karma thing. He has, on the one hand, this emphasis on freedom. But on the other, there's this karma that you've inherited from your past life. So you have the same tension that we would have with respect to astrology versus, say, free will. You're dealing with limitations in life, always. And the limitations are what uh, provide you with the sort of incentive to uh, to move on, to accomplish things. So that's the sort of uh, Steiner's model. 
of the uh, architecture of the cell body. And it's uh, now, uh, of course, that doesn't clarify what, the, what, what we mean by these upper three. And I can't get too much into that except to say that <coughs> the spirit body is the sublimation of the physical body, the life spirit of the etheric body, spirit cell. Okay, so spirit cell is something that can be developed through um, exercises which he terms imagination. Now, he says, let's say you, you decide you want to go onto the spiritual path and you want to start the process. He says, the first thing you're going to want to develop is the ego wants to start work on the astral body. That's the first thing. So it's the easiest to do. And the way in which it does that is through imagination. This is very close to the Jungian individuation process. And it has simply to do with contemplation of images. And the images have to be contemplated in a certain way, though. And, for example, he gives a couple of, uh, of uh, okay. exercises where he says, um, let's say, you know, the first thing, what you really want to do in order to attain knowledge of the higher worlds is you want to learn how to disengage your mind from your senses. You have to be able to hold, yeah, hold the soul out of its immersion in the body so that you don't take everything you see so at face value. He says there, there is, there's a gradual training process for doing this. And he starts with like the most basic exercise. And he says, imagine a seed. Just imagine in your palm that there's a plant seed there. Now, what's within that plant seed? The entire future history of that plant is in that seed. But you can't see it. It's in there, but you can't see it. You know that if you put the seed into the ground and give it what it needs, it will generate a plant in time. You know all of that. But your senses don't tell you that. Your mind tells you that. If you were to put a copy of the seed that was a fake seed next to that seed, as far as your senses could tell, the two are absolutely identical. But your mind knows that in the true seed, there's going to be a real plant that comes out of that. So your mind can access knowledge that is not available to your senses. And he says that's sort of basic exercise number one, is to train your mind to think in this way to, to be able to see into the invisible forces that are at work in the world. And he always gives these sort of anything to do with plants is etheric. He always gives you these sort of etheric exercises, meditating on the plant world to, to sort of begin. Like he'll talk about also meditate upon, you know, the formation of a rose. What happens there? Well, uh, this sort of rose comes up out of the ground and these green juices come up and they ascend and they're refined into this red sap. And the red sap sort of produces this beautiful redness of this rose. And he says, what's happening there? Well, if you notice what's happening is these lower, um, this actually almost presupposes a knowledge of Goethe's metamorphosis of plants, but Goethe's theory was that the lower juices in a plant are gradually refined as the plant ascends and grows. It gets more and more sublimated and it refines these juices and it sort of gets rid of the lower juices by putting out stem leaves and the stem leaves take up these excess nourishments and finally the more refined the juices are as they ascend up, the more refined they become and they're used for the formation of the, of the spiritual part of the plant, the, the blossom, the corolla. And he says, you know, that all sort of takes place without any passion. There's no real struggle. You know, plants don't have an astral body. There's no, if you compare that with what happens in a human being, a human being is racked with passions and desires and the, the whole sexual problem and the maturation problem. And, and there, there are all these lower forces at work which are much more difficult to harness. But he says that the human being, notice, possesses something that the plant doesn't have. Though the plant has this process that unfolds naturally, the human being has these upper faculties of spirit, which the plant doesn't have. So the human being, though there are more things that can go wrong in the development of the human being, can also attain to a level of consciousness that is far greater than anything that can ever develop out of the plant world. So he says, you know, just sort of imagine this, Imagine the analogy, you know, imagine this sort of cross, and imagine that it's a black cross, and the cross is, uh, this is actually the Rosicrucian meditation, uh, and the black cross corresponds to the lower passions in the human being. And then he says, imagine these sort of red roses germinating seven of them in a circle out of that cross, and you'll have an idea of what we mean in this spiritual model of the sublimation of these sort of lower energies into these higher, upper spiritual energies within the human being. But the point is, what, I mean, whether we can, I almost don't understand what he means there, but the point about it is imaginative exercises have to do with the contemplation of mental images, or even, you know, draw them out, or how, however you want to do it. 
But the point is to begin to train your mind to think in a spiritual way. And anybody can learn how to do this just by meditating on you know, processes that we normally see every day, the growth of plants uh, and animals, what have you. Just think about these mundane things in a way that enables you to see that there are these invisible forces at work behind these phenomena, and you'll be on the way to the development and cultivation of the spirit self, which will then gradually come into maturity. I think that sounds a lot like the Jungian individuation process, which has to do with the activation of the imagination, getting the imagination activated and projecting out the contents of the unconscious into you know, a painting or a drawing or art. You know, that's what the soul wants. It's naturally inherently creative, and it wants that engagement with images. So the astral has to do with uh, images in one form or another. Remember, animals have the astral body and they have dreaming consciousness, so there's that imagistic element that's common to both the astral and the spirit self. When you move into the life spirit, this is much harder to do because now you're not just sort of gaining control of your passions and desires, which as we've said happens normally anyway, generally through the maturation process, you know, ideally. Um, but what you want to change now, what you want to get down into are the deep-seated character traits, and those are much harder to change. Habits, you know, the reprogramming of, of long-term habits, you know, like let's say you're alcoholic and you want to reprogram that. It's really hard to do, you know, until you've fallen all the way down and have messed up your life, your job, ruined your marriage. You, you get this accumulation of noise uh, before you get this buildup such that your life is ready for the sudden transformation. The third body is really hard to change just by the sort of day-to-day -day basis. So you have to sort of work into the etheric body, and I'm not sure how that works. Uh, he calls this um, inspiration rather than imagination. And now it involves, as soon as you bring in inspiration, by inspiration he means inspiration from the divine beings. So now you're beginning to relate. You're not just uh, sort of contemplating mental images. You're beginning to relate now to the spiritual world. You're beginning to communicate with it. Uh, and inspirations have more to do with sound than they do with image. So that with imagination we have sort of pictures and with um, inspiration we have to do more with sound, namely the harmony of the cosmic spheres. This has to do with a hearing of a kind of cosmic music that inspires you such that you can begin to see the cosmic interrelationships between all things, how these cosmic beings are involved in all of these great life processes. And this will bring about the change in the religious orientation, which is also linked with the etheric body. This brings this sort of religious uh, consciousness into being now. That's linked with the etheric body. And um, then eventually you have the spirit body, which he says is developed through what he calls intuition. And so we have imagination, inspiration, and intuition. And you can't have knowledge of past lives until you've moved into the stage of intuition. And, and, and intuition has to do not only with being able to see into your past lives, but also to identify with spiritual beings. You can actually sort of uh, incarnate your consciousness in the consciousness of another being and sort of identify with it on that experiential level. Uh, it's a little bit like Stan Graf's holotropic uh, breath work where he talks about people having experiential identifications with plant consciousness in these states where they'll see themselves as this plant or as an animal or uh, as a dinosaur or something, whatever. There's this identification with other forms of consciousness. And that begins, of course, to open up compassion, and uh, all of that comes in. So I don't really uh, claim to understand exactly how these work. And this is the area in Steiner that I would like to do more research on, specifically how that develops. But you have, anyway, the structural skeleton that will give you an orientation. Uh, should you decide to sit down and read these things, you'll already know at least where he's heading. And then, uh, so that brings us up to that point. Now, um, what I just want to show you then is how I'll, can we have a little bit more air? This thing, air <laughs> uh, how these things develop over the uh, life cycle. Excuse me? Yes. Um, we're needing a break, please. Oh, okay, yeah, well then uh, let's, uh, let's have a break uh, and uh, we'll have uh, the way I've arranged the material as we go along is it gets weirder and weirder from simple stuff at the beginning, and then we'll gradually move into the angelic hierarchies and his creation myth, and some of the things he says, you, you just cannot believe what, you know, what is he saying? But, um, so with the architecture, though, how hopefully will lend it a certain credibility just the way I'm laying it out. Um, but the next thing is the human life cycle, and this is certainly, I mean, this is very compatible with astrology, I think, particularly the Saturn cycle, which breaks up into seven years. 
And then Uranus and Neptune are multiples of seven, so they're probably, they could be linked with this as well, probably. Um, so we have the age of zero to seven. And uh, the infant is born from the physical womb, and the physical womb is to the physical body, which develops during these first seven years. Uh, so this is the period of the etheric body, which is the next thing that's developing. But it's covered in its own kind of etheric womb during this seven-year period. And it's sort of protected within that. And during these seven years, uh, memory is very poor. Um, that's why this period is the hardest to remember, because the forces that are the etheric body uh, that we use later for the development of memory are being used here on the body itself. Um, and I think, too, with all these associations with the etheric body, and then Snyder expands it to sort of say the etheric forces in the cosmos and all of that, pretty much is the same thing that Rupert Sheldrake is talking about, about morphogenetic fields, which is the sort of memory that's implicit throughout creation. Um, it's a sort of revival of this idea of the etheric uh, body. So from about the age of zero to seven, the etheric body, then at the change of the teeth at uh, the age of seven, the, this thing sort of disintegrates, and the etheric body now is freed up and can be used for the cultivation of memory. One thing I noticed here, you remember Steiner saying uh, that it was about the age of seven that he saw his first ghost. Well, it's interesting. I did a little research on alien abduction phenomena. I was, for the next book I'm writing, there's a chapter in it on extraterrestrial mythology. And I was delighted to uh, really immerse myself in the, in the literature and read these things, which is absolutely fantastic accounts. And um, very often these abductees will recount, you know, when they go under hypnosis and they say, well, I've had this abduction, and then I went to hypnosis, and again and again they recount. Actually, they remember it's been happening all their lives, but usually it starts right around the age of seven, I noticed. Uh, sometimes some of them will remember being abducted as early as the age of three. But I find it interesting that, it's, that it normally links back right around the age of seven or eight. If you read John Mack's Abductions, uh, who was a you know, Harvard-trained uh, psychiatrist who lost all of his respect from all of his academics when he wrote this book, Abduction, uh, that takes these things seriously. But most of the people in that book, the case studies that he give, all start uh, right around the age of seven and eight, remembering these uh, abduction phenomena. And I think, too, also, that Steiner gives us the key to what's going on in the alien abduction phenomena. Uh, the gods and beings that he's talking about, not the angelic beings, but uh, as we s we'll see, he'll talk about, the Earth itself has an etheric body. And the only reason we have an etheric body is because we're embedded in the Earth's etheric body. That's an early version of the Gaia hypothesis. And um, he says, furthermore, that there are these elemental beings that live within the Earth's etheric body. And even in his the one mystery play that I did read, he has uh, a couple of these elemental beings, uh, sylphs and gnomes, come in. And he describes them in a way that sounds like the way we describe extraterrestrials, as these gray little beings with round heads. And um, I think these things may be real beings. I think they may be what Steiner was talking about as the elemental beings that live within the Earth's etheric body. I don't think they've come from outer space. I think they're within the Earth, and I do think they're real beings. And I think Steiner knew this. Um, so that's why I say when he's Aristotle of the New Age, this, you can link almost every bizarre phenomenon that's going on in our culture back with some idea in Steiner. So the etheric body, anyway, comes into maturity uh, at about the age of seven. Then we have um, seven to 14, and this is the development of the astral body. It, too, is protected by a sheath, which then dissolves at the age of 14. We all know what happens there. The astral body has to do with sexuality. The sexual drive comes in. All the hormonal changes happen. Menstruation begins. Masturbation begins but in, for boys. And the whole process starts, and the, the sexual energies just are unleashed at the moment of the disintegration of this thing. So we have that problem, uh, 7 to 14. Then we have uh, 14 to tw uh, 21. I don't know why I'm looking at this. It's just every seven years. 14 to 21, uh, we have the development then of the uh, etheric astral and, uh, what am I forgetting? Sentient soul developing, yes. The sentient soul comes right in about the age of 21 because we start moving into the development of the ego and really maturity. Maturity starts coming in and uh, the ego really has to do with a sense of maturity and the sentient soul comes in right about the age of 21 and then as we're moving to uh, 21 to the Saturn return, what is it, 28? Uh, the mind 
trained soul or the intellectual soul comes in. So the individual becomes fully intellectually mature right about the time of the Saturn return. Um, and then we have uh, 20 to 35 for the next one that the consciousness soul comes in. And that's the sense of uh, really, you know, the sense of will and freedom and the idea right in that age range that but there's no one responsible for your life but you, right? That's usually when you, s you really start to realize that you are the final authority for your life. Everything that's happening to you is coming from you. It's not the fault of faulty upbringing or the fault of your parents or economic shortages in your society. It's you. It's coming out of you. And this is the age normally when the individual is either going to take responsibility for everything that's going on or they're just not. Some people never do. But the majority of us, I think, naturally right around that age come in and, and we realize that... Uh, we have this freedom of will. And we can make these decisions and shape our life however we want. 35 to 42 then is the period of the uh, spirit self begins to come in naturally, at least the rudiments of it, the seed form of it. You can't, you have to do these sorts of yogic exercises that I was talking about in order to bring these things into perfection. But now the only thing I can think of here with respect to the spirit self is the fact that Steiner says that one should not begin teaching before the age of 40. And uh, that's a hard word for me. I'm not 40 yet. I'm way under that. But, uh, but the spirit self, a person is not, well, particularly with respect to the spiritual wor world, a person is not yet fully mature until that age. And indeed, it was right, that's Uranus, opposite Uranus. And it's right in that age range that Steiner began speaking publicly and was asked to speak all over Europe. Um, and then we have sort of, uh, what is it, 42 to 49? And the life spirit... And then uh, in the 49 to 56. Spirit body. That's coming up on the second Saturn return. Now. And that's sort of the morphology of the life cycle. It's interesting that Steiner didn't live much past this, this life cycle that he sort of mapped out on seven year cycles. He had just started a new seven year life cycle. He was out of this and had just started a new one. Uh, before he died. So that's how these things will just sort of naturally come into maturity through the course of the life cycle. I, d I don't fully understand uh, these, uh, how these upper three work, where they come in, and how they operate. Um, but now with respect to the planets, and here it gets interesting for astrologers because um, Steiner links the planets with these developments. And he says, the way in which the planets are involved here is he says when we look when we look out into space and we look at the planets, well we're not we're not seeing just planets. He says <coughs> the planets are the outer physical embodiments of colonies of spiritual beings. And in Bardo, before you were born, as you went through these planets, exactly as in the Ptolemaic model, he's really trying to retrieve the Ptolemaic model. Uh, as the soul was in Bardo, it journeys through these planetary spheres, and um, and the spiritual beings that are involved in each one of these planetary spheres is what it helps the soul to work out its karma in each of these spheres. And each of these bodies relates to events that were developed in the respective planetary sphere before incarnation. So that if you attain to the state that he called uh, inspiration, then you can begin to see into this process. Um, so he says uh, the first phase has to do with the moon, and then the second one has to do with Mercury, Venus, and then what he calls the great sun period, these middle three are all the sun. This is the sort of apogee of the human life cycle. The noon of life is traditionally regarded as 33. That's when Christ is crucified and all that whole And then uh, sun, and then, uh, what have I left out? That's not right. Yeah, Mars, Jupiter, set for uh, 56 or 63. Um, and then he says, um, while the soul is in Bardo, for example, um, Mercury has to do with health and illness. And he says, uh, while you're in that sphere, you're working out the health and illness of your next life. 
And he says, traditionally, actually, uh, the individual tends to be healthier between 7 and 14 than between 0 and 7 or 14 and 21. So that uh, the karma for health usually sort of manifests itself, good, the good aspect of it, between that period. And then, of course, Venus has to do with the sex drive and the coming in of the sexual energies of 14 to 21. And then we have the great sun period and the intellectual faculties coming in with the sun. Uh, and then you have Saturn over here on the Saturn return. I'm not sure about Mars and Jupiter, although Mars has to do with certain aggressive qualities, uh, the courage and the, those faculties, and Jupiter with wisdom. Um, so uh, you have these planetary correlations with the human life cycle, and um, so there is this kind of astrological compatibility with Steiner, though you never hear him talking about uh, traditional astrology, other than the procession of the equinoxes in the great year, which we'll get into. So that's the uh, human life cycle in accordance with the unfolding of these faculties and their relationship to the planets. So then what we want to do next is, um, I believe, look at Steiner's model. And let's look at his uh, angelic hierarchy. Let's look at him, uh, now we begin to move up into the spiritual world since we've already touched on this. And as we said, uh, with the model of Dionysius the Areopagite, we have Seraphim, which Steiner renames Spirits of Love. Cherubim, he renames Wisdom. because they'll become significant in his creation myth, because the name that he gives them corresponds with the function of the role that they play in the creation of the cosmos. And the archangels then become spirits of fire. And finally we have the angels, per se, which he names spirits of twilight. So that's his renaming of the hierarchies. As far as God goes, Steiner doesn't say much about God per se. He really is a polytheist, and this is his sort of pantheon of beings. The Christ being is a being from the hierarchy of the powers. And he'll say that the Christ being, uh, the powers are linked with the, let's link them with their respective planets then so that we don't get lost. The uh, angels link with the moon, archangels with Mercury, Archai with Venus. The powers are the beings that live within the sun, and the Christ being was the central being within that. Um, and then the mites are linked with Mars, the dominions with Jupiter, the thrones with Saturn. And the cherubim with the zodiac. And Seraphim traditionally would have been linked with the Empyrean, but they're not linked with anything like that at Steiner. Um, now, one of the strikes against Steiner is uh, the absence of Uranus and Neptune in his system. He knew about, of course, the discovery of Uranus in 1781 and Neptune in the middle of the uh, 19th century. But he says there's something weird about the outer planets. There's a reason why they weren't traditional. And he says they have these weird configurations like retrograde moons, um, and of course now we know Uranus, by some strange cosmic event, has been knocked up onto its side. Um, something has displaced it so that its, you know, its north-south axis are where it are is east-west. Um, there are strange things about the outer planets, and Steiner doesn't really take them into account. He says there are, of course, spiritual beings involved in the outer planets, just as there are with these planets. He says they're not really involved in what's going on in the drama of our solar system. They're very remote. And of course, Pluto was discovered five years after his death in 1930, so that wouldn't have been taken into account at all. <coughs> um, 
so uh, that's how he links these things with the planets. And um, so what he does is, um, with regard to the, the ascent of the soul after death, um, he sort of has the soul, just as in the Ptolemaic model, the soul journeys through these spheres at death. And um, has everybody got this? That, that needs it? So let's look at his model of death briefly. And he says um, that the dying process is divided into very distinct stages. And uh, it's very similar to what happens in the uh, Tibetan Book of the Dead, actually. <laughs> he says, um, normally the etheric body is bound up with the physical body and it always has to stay that way. At night when you go to sleep, what happens is the astral body lifts up out with the ego and separates from the physical and the etheric body and goes into the astral plane. And when it's still sort of linked with the etheric body, you're in the dreaming state, but when you're in deep dreamless sleep, the connection has been severed. And so he says every night we journey out into this planetary cosmos, the astral plane of it, not the physical cosmos, but the astral version of it. Every night we journey into this cosmos. And every night we deal with our karma, and uh, you'll notice that, by the way, that the people that recur in our dreams, this is something that occurred to me lately, uh, the people that we've known in our lives, the people that recur in our dreams are actually very few. There are very few of them compared to how many people we do meet and become acquainted with. There are only a handful of them that recur again and again and again in our dreams. And Steiner says, those are the people with whom you were involved in past lives. And the reason those people or stay in your memories long after you've ceased to know them, to have known them, even from childhood. The reason that there's so few of them and the reason they stay in your memories and keep recurring in your dreams is because they were karmic partners in past lives. And uh, those are the ones that, that stick. So he says what happens to um, the soul is um, if the etheric body separates from the physical body, remember that the body dies because the etheric forces stop organizing the body and it begins to return into the mineral world. So that's what happens. Now, now the first thing that happens at the moment of death is the etheric body with the astral body and the ego lift up out of the body. And the etheric body, this is a process that lasts for about three days. And the etheric body hovers near the physical body for about three days. And he says this cliche uh, you know, the, the whole cliche about uh, my life flashed in front of my eyes. Steiner says that's a real phenomenon that happens, and why it happens is because the etheric body has all the memory of your life up to that point stored within it. And at the moment that it's released, it spreads out in a sudden panorama of everything that's happened to you. And that just sort of flashes into being. And the process lasts for about three days. It varies from individual to individual. And this thing hovers near the physical body. And indeed, from what people, you know, recount, uh, that seems to be pretty close with uh, the accounts that we hear of uh, people dying and hovering near their bodies and, you know, floating within the vicinity um, and the sort of past life, everything that's happened to you sort of flashing in front of your eyes. That seems to be pretty consistent with the accounts that we've, we've heard. Um, so that's the first three days. Then he says, the soul begins then as the etheric body disintegrates and falls apart. Then the astral body carries the ego with it out into the cosmos, into the astral plane, and for a period that lasts a third the length of your life. If you look for 60 years, this period will last for about 20. What happens is, what this corresponds to purgatory now. This is not only a past life review, but now what happens to the soul is, remember, you're still within the astral vehicle, so you still have a certain sensory aspect, is you relive your life backwards. Everything that is the most recent events that have taken place begin to unfold backwards for this whole period. And not only that, but everything, every bit of harm that you have caused to everyone else, you now begin to experience within this period from the point of view of the person that you have done the damage to. So there's a purgatorial process that takes place in the afterlife, this corresponds very closely to the Tibetan Book of the Dead, when uh, the soul is unleashed and these sort of demonic beings will come at you because they're reflections of your own uh, limitations. 
And this is the same thing Steiner says uh, is what is going on. You're going through this purgatorial process, and all the passions and desires that you have that have not fulfilled themselves are keenly felt at this moment. But now you no longer have the organs to fulfill them. So there's a, there's a, there's, there can be a torment here, depending on how you've lived your life. And this all, he sort of links with the moon sphere. Um, and he says, before you can get up into any of those other sort of planetary spheres, everything here has to be left behind in the moon sphere. Everything that's linked with uh, passion, desire, uh, unfulfilled desires, everything, that all has to gradually burn away during that third of your life period. That has to be burned out. And when it is finally burned out and left behind, the astral body crumbles and disintegrates. Now you've got the ego left. And the ego begins to ascend now uh, into what he calls Divashan, which is the upper, the spirit world. This lower world was the astral plane, also known as Kamaloka. Now we begin to ascend into Divashan, but Divashan is divided into an upper and a lower Divashan, and the lower Divashan corresponds to the rest of the planets. The ascent up through the planets, up to Saturn, and as you would go into each one of these planets, um, you participate with spiritual beings that work on the qualities that are associated with your soul in each of these, like Mercury, you're dealing with health problems. And at the same time, they're helping you to construct the future vehicle of your next incarnation. Now this period goes on for centuries. The, um, Steiner says that ideally the normal period between lifetimes of incarnation is about a thousand years. That will vary from individual to individual. Sometimes it's 500, uh, uh, sometimes it's you know, a little more than that. But usually between 500 and about 1,200 is the length of time between each incarnation. And he says not only that, but ideally previously your past incarnation will have been of the opposite sex. So we incarnate within the, every 2,000 years we go through the experience of male and female. And he says the reason that's so is because we're linked with the procession of the equinoxes with each of the platonic months. We reincarnate because the culture of the world has changed so much. It takes that long for it to completely change that the circumstances change during that period such that uh, we're ready to re-enter the historical process now with a new body and new karma and the whole process begins over. So that's about how long the period that is spent in these upper worlds, these planetary worlds, takes very long time, centuries. And, uh, you know, as you're going through this sort of sun sphere, you're working on uh, abilities that are associated with the intellect. And he says, the more, the further along you were in this process we discussed, the spiritual process of constructing uh, the spirit self and the spirit body, the more you will be able to consciously participate with these angelic beings in the construction of your next life. The more conscious you will be in the afterlife, in the construction of what's going to take place. Then you sort of come up to higher Divashan, the upper, the sort of what he calls midnight of the soul's ascent, and then it begins the descent process. It goes back through these planetary spheres and begins to reconstruct now the architecture of the subtle body. Uh, it builds for itself the ego as the monad that's reincarnating, then it builds for itself an astral, a new astral body as it descends through these spheres, and then a new etheric body as it descends down to the moon, and then um, as it builds this, the karma is being stored in and being worked in. And he says, just as at the moment of death, you had a past life review, so just before you're reincarnated, you have a future life preview. You see everything that's going to happen in terms of the larger karmic events. Your will is free here, so things can be changed. But what you see is the karmic hindrances now that will need to be removed in the process of this next life that's coming in. There will cer certain karmic problems need to be resolved, and you'll have a clear preview of that at the moment of incarnation. And he says, what attracts two people sexually to each other, and he sort of, I think he's picked up this idea from Schopenhauer, on Schopenhauer's chapter on the metaphysics of sexual love, what attracts a couple sexually to each other are unborn souls willing themselves into being. And he says, um, you sort of select your parents, the parents that you know will provide you with the physical body, that you, with the genetic inheritance, the hereditary characteristics that you will need that will suit the karma that's necessary for your life. So he says everything is, has been uh, more or less consciously chosen by us, the life that we're living, and um, as we come into being, the, the soul, you know, we sort of, uh, we're sort of selecting our parents, and the soul is attracted uh, to the lovemaking of a specific couple, and it comes down and it goes 
sort of hovers for a while outside of the embryo as it's conceived and then gradually sort of works its way down into the embryo as the embryo is being developed within the mother womb. Um, so all of this has been chosen, but you forget all of this, just as in the old Ptolemaic model we discussed last night, you've forgotten all of this. And um, so the process of life, once you're brought into being in a particular time, in a particular place, that karma has all been chosen and agreed upon by you and the spiritual beings that have brought you into being, uh, the task now consists in finding out what your mission was. Somebody asked Steiner what, uh, I think he said, uh, one of his friends said, um, what do you think the purpose of life is? I mean, it's so much filled with suffering, and it's, uh, you know, what, it, it's, uh, there's so much unhappiness. It doesn't seem to be the case that we were put here to be, you know, happy, does it? And he says, well, Steiner said, well, I don't think happiness or unhappiness is, is the case. I don't think that's what life is all about. What it is about is the fulfillment of a specific task. Each one of us has been given a specific task. And our task, then, is to find out what that mission was, what we agreed upon in Bardo before we incarnated, find out what that is, and fulfill it. And what isn't fulfilled, then, that's karma that gets stored up for the next incarnation. And this process goes on and on until the physical bodies, you know, the astral and etheric bodies, have been sublimated and brought to full maturation, have been brought to full perfection. The spirit is the bouquet of the physical. And it gradually has to mature and ripen over these uh, lifetimes. So one thing we see there is this conflict between karma and freedom. Now, freedom is the most important thing in Steiner. But we're dealing with karma at the same time. On the other hand, we did play a certain <coughs> role in the formation and choosing of a specific life at a specific time. So there was a certain freedom involved within Bardo. Um, so we're always dealing with these two exigencies, karma, what is karmically necessary, and the way in which we respond to the, to the karmic necessity of the particular situation that arises. Our will is free. We can always choose which way we're going to go in a particular situation. And if a relationship, you know, doesn't get karmically resolved the way it's supposed to, it gets stored up for the next time around, and that person will reincarnate with you. Another thing he says is that people tend to reincarnate in groups. They all tend to reincarnate in groups. That's a strange thing. I'm not sure how that, how that works out. But he says, you know, everybody who's living now, more or less, was living a thousand years ago. And um, they tend to be karmically involved with each other within these groups. And uh, it's just sort of an interesting uh, side note. And in karmic relationships, when he's looking at the past lives of all these individuals that he was talking about in the 19th century, you know, he looks into the past life of Darwin and Nietzsche. Most of these individuals, particularly the uh, Darwin, Nietzsche, Francis Bacon, particularly the materialists, he says, are normally these reincarnated Arab philosophers. For some reason, uh, there may be an anti-Semitism there. I'm not sure what it is, but he's, he connects the materialism that went on in the 19th century, the descent and decline into materialism, with reincarnated Muslims from, uh, you know, a thousand years ago, from about normally the time of the courts of Harun al-Rashid, about 800 A.D. He says, you know, that was a, 800 A.D., you know, we were in the Dark Ages in the time of Charlemagne, and Charlemagne could barely read himself. But in Baghdad, meanwhile, at the courts of Harun al-Rashid, who reincarnates later as Francis Bacon, at the courts of Harun al-Rashid, there was this wonderful renaissance, this culture, these arts and sciences, and these Muslims are just absolutely brilliant. But there's a certain, um, way in which he associates the Arabic mentality with these individuals who reincarnate as materialistic thinkers. And he says Arabism sort of worked its way over across North Africa and came up into Spain and was stopped and then pushed out before the Crusades had even gotten off the ground. The Arabs are basically pushed out of Spain. But then he said there was a wheel there working its way up into Europe that was checked and then resumed through these reincarnations that began then to take place a thousand years later when these individuals began to work their way into the culture karmically, bringing the Arabic scientific mentality into our culture. Very strange ideas this man has there, but there, you know, there's a certain incredible brilliance about them. It's like, where is he coming up with these things? Are they true or are they not? I mean, it's just, it's hard to say. Um, but in any event, um, that's his sort of model of the, um, of the death process. And uh, anybody have anything they want to discuss with relation to that? Any reflections or? If not, we can move on to the next.
Now, why don't we move on to... Uh, uh, just a moment. I just wrote down some questions there way back there. Okay, sure. Okay. And one, you know, like where you said that he doesn't talk about love and sex. Right. Very much so well, he talks about compassion, love in that sense, but not sexual love, not romantic love. Okay, because it seems like it's such an important part of the, the spirit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and that's in the compassionate sense. The, the whole, in fact, he says the purpose of cosmic evolution at this point right now is to create love saturated within the, the entire... When the Earth has gone through the cycle, the in incarnation cycle that it's in now, it will have perfused love throughout everything. And that is the ultimate goal of this phase of our evolution. The past epoch, as we'll see, was the creation of wisdom within uh, you know, the etheric body, the Bhyanamaya Kosha, the etheric sheath. Uh, but now it's the creation of, of love, and the Christ being has a lot to do with bringing this down, and uh, and uh, all, the Buddha also, as he says. But we'll look at that um, probably after lunch. Okay, so now it's to saturate everything with this love. Yes, and to, oh, yes, and love and, and compassion are, are absolutely uh, the most essential thing, I think, in his system, along with this idea of freedom and karma. Did he ever see love and sex as being he, he almost never mentioned sex. That's the thing that's missing. And that seems so bizarre because it's so much a part of everything. Yeah, that's why I think there, there may be something to this theory about a certain repressed sexuality in him. Okay, another thing, uh, I have something about the angelic hierarchy, which you might be getting to, but now is this possibly what we think of as the star ancestors? As the, as the star ancestors? I guess I'm thinking of the Native American terminology. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Steiner will say, um, all the world's traditions who have recognized gods of any sort are always these same gods. He's just picked up the Christian terminology, but he, he would be willing to say these are the same beings that you find recognized in all these other religions. Basically the same, they're just given different names as evolution proceeds. Because so many other cultures, you know, they have had experiences, you know, when the God has been passed down through their yes. culture. Yes, and I think he'll say something like, uh, with respect to the Aboriginal cultures like the Australian Aborigines and their ancestor beings, I think he'll say these are the Earth's elemental beings that he was talking about that I think are linked with the extraterrestrials that are abducting people. I think these are probably uh, these neglected beings who uh, I'm not sure what's going on, but there's something to do with the fact that they've been neglected. And, uh, you know, it, it occurred to me um, the similarities. If you read uh, a couple of these abduction accounts, enough of them to just get a familiarity. You know, I guess you can just watch a couple of the movies like uh, Communion, that Whitley Stryber thing, or the uh, Fire in the Sky. Those give you the basic images of you know, being abducted, taken up into these spacecraft, and these experiments that are performed on them. What I noticed when I thought about those is, you know, that sounds a lot like what shamans describe when they describe their abduction by ancestral beings who come and take them and pull their bodies apart refill them, they sort of break the bones, they put diamonds into the bones, and they sort of do these tormenting processes to the shamanic initiates, reconstruct them, put them back together, uh, and, you know, in visionary trance, and then uh, restore them to their community. But now they have deep shamanic powers where they can relate to this. I think there may be something similar is going on here. I think the same process that was happening in shamanic initiation abductions are happening now in these extraterrestrial abductions. But there's a failure. There, there's somehow, it's not working the same way. It's as though these beings are selecting beings to become these uh, types of shamanic healing individuals. But because our culture can't take that in and doesn't have a model for it, these individuals feel victimized. And they have no idea what's happened to them. And they, you know, they just think they're victims. But I think what's happening is they're being selected by these beings for special tasks. But they don't know that uh, because they haven't been, there's, there's no precedent in our, in our culture for, for teaching that. Um, so I think a lot of these are just sort of abortive attempts that, um, that um, plus the, uh, the whole thing, of, I'm working on this in my book now, the whole thing about these genetic experiments where usually uh, they extract DNA, they, they tend to extract sperm from men and eggs from women, and supposedly uh, they, they're making these, um, a lot of times these uh, human extraterrestrial, uh, you know, offspring. And that's a little bit, you know, you can read that poetically and say, well, what does that mean, a human extraterrestrial offspring? Well, look at the Bible. Go back to Genesis 6, and what do you have there? You have the Nephilim. The Nephilim are these fallen angelic beings who descend to the earth uh, because they're attracted to beautiful human women, 
and they mate with the human women and produce these monstrous giants who are angelic human fusions. And um, uh, you know, the positive thing is the Nephilim uh, supposedly taught women how to beautify themselves, men how to fight, so they teach uh, all the arts of civilization, uh, but at the same time, they do this spiritual no-no within the Jewish system of the intermixing of man and God. Within the Hebraic system, that's a no-no. And so it's at that moment that God decides to wipe everything out. He doesn't want the divine world intermixed with the human world in the book of Genesis. And that is the reason why he sends the flood. It doesn't so much state that in the Bible. You have to go to the apocryphal text to find that. This book of Jubilees has it very clearly. And uh, one Enoch uh, is very clear about this, the reason for God's wiping out. So there is a precedent uh, for this. And I think that these, uh, these extraterrestrial beings uh, are these angelic beings um, and the, also the Earth's elemental creatures. And um, this genetic fusion sounds to me like there's a process whereby these beings are, are trying to fuse with us again, to try to create some kind of spiritual consciousness that will interface with us. And, you know, this is, they may be able to sort of change shape and take on the, the shape that we will, you know, the cosmology of the universe has changed so much, as we saw last night, that we don't buy this crap about angels anymore, but we will accept the idea that there may be beings from other worlds coming. They know that. And that's the form, that's why they've taken on that form. But I think there are too many similarities between the mythology that's associated with extraterrestrials, UFOs, biblical imagery, and the imagery of shamanic cultures for this to be mere coincidence. It's not. It's the same thing going on in contemporary guys. So this is one of the chapters that I'm working on in my book right now is, is uh, showing how, how this process is working itself out. And so, so the reason they want to connect with the physical to join, merge with is because of the consciousness level that we Probably because of our lack of, because of, you know, in the Jungian sense, anything that's neglected, you know, keeps trying to come back to get your attention. Probably just because, as Steiner will, will as we'll see, he says, you know, the, the price that we pay for this differentiation of ego is a gradual loss of contact with the spiritual worlds, a gradual loss of relationship to spiritual beings. They've gradually been taken less and less and less seriously. And I think now this is their way now of trying to get our attention, is forcing themselves For us to develop that more. Yes, yes. And they're sort, of, they're, they're sort of mimicking our worst sort of scientific mentality of slicing things open and performing experiments on nature and torturing animals. It's almost like they're sort of doing that on us as, as a way of gaining our attention and saying, look, you know, this is what you're doing to nature. There are some ecological dimensions involved with this too. Some of these people say that these beings come and uh, give them apocalyptic visions about floods and things that will happen if we continue spoiling and disrupting the Earth's ecological systems. So I think they probably are. Uh, these things are really happening and I think we should take them seriously. Um, and one other thing, if they're trying to awaken that in us, then are they not also reaching for the inferior function within? That I don't know. Possibly. And I'm not sure. I'm, wanting to, I'm, I'm not sure either. Yeah. It's blowing that out. It's a good possibility. Oh, one other question is, how did Steiner tap into reading the supposed past lives of what the... I didn't quite understand that. No, I don't understand either. Uh, it's, it's an ability that he claims he had, that he just developed, but he says anyone can develop it. And I've only come across a few passages where he gives these specific exercises for developing it, and I just don't understand it at all. One of them was something to the effect of, let's say you want to uh, remember, to find out what the karmic connection was between something mundane to you that happened yesterday. As they are, sit down and visualize what happened to you yesterday and think about it. I mean, just really visualize it in your mind and reconstruct it in your mind, be very clear and vivid about it, and then go to bed that night. As you go to bed that night, your, your um, astral body will begin working on it, processing it. You wake up the next day, then you sort of check on it and you think about it again, go about your business the next night, the astral body will then imprint this into the etheric body. The etheric body will work on it. So after a few days of this process, it sinks into the etheric body, and then gradually, he says, it should eventually occur to you what the karmic connection was to a past life. And he says, sometimes uh, you have to be persistent about it and keep doing it, because it's not going to work at first. He says, you have to do it over and over and over again until you teach your etheric body 
how to begin accessing these memories. He may be right about that. I don't have the time to try that. Um, but he, he may be right about it. But um, it does remind me of Stan Groff's holotropic thing, where these people are dropping down into the, the sort of holotropic realm, and some of them are retrieving memories of past lives. So maybe there's something to it in that respect. But um, I don't think he's getting these things. If he was seeing into these past lives, I think it's just this you know, shamanic ability that he has to, to just perceive this. Uh, the rest of us will, will have to do all this work to get into that that it doesn't come so easily to. But I think in his case, uh, these are just intuitive flashes. Um, he's remarkably consistent about these things. Um, the eight volumes of karmic relationships um, were given all over Europe within 1924 in different locations, different times. But he tells the same story every time he's talking about the reincarnation of a specific person. He never makes a mistake, never contradicts himself, always gives the same details. And there's a lot of them to remember. I mean, a lot of them. So, I don't know. I, um, I'm curious about this hermetic astrology and seeing if there's any, indeed, any relationship between death charts and birth charts. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and what do you mean by death charts? Well, the time, the, the time, the transits that are being made at the moment that the person dies. You look at those, and then the, the hard thing is there's this thousand year gap. But uh, this guy, Robert Powell, does, if you use the sidereal zodiac, then you've got the background of the fixed stars. So it's a little easier to do. And then he says, um, you also have to draw from uh, a heliocentric ephemeris, because there's a, uh, there's a heliocentric aspect to transits. And then there's these, uh, just the general sidereal ephemeris. Both have to be used. So you have to have two charts, a heliocentric and a sidereal. Uh, I think you also have to use a geocentric sidereal and a heliocentric. And then um, use both of those. And then, so he, he, he actually looks at, I can show the book to anybody who wants to look at it, there's the little charts are in there, of Haruna <coughs> uh, past life, you know, 800 AD, and um, then the birth chart of Francis Bacon. And I'm not entirely convinced because there's a lot of twisting and turning that he has to do to get these transits to map on. There's a few, but uh, one of the things that he does say is that um, the angular, he says, the first, this is Robert Powell, the Steinerian, the first law of reincarnation with respect to these birth charts is that, you know, if you, if you get one of the, study one of these individualities that Steiner's talking about, if you can obtain these birth data information, the first law is that the angular relationship between Saturn and Mars is always the same. The, uh, the death chart maps on uh, the angular relationship between Saturn and Mars always turns up in the birth chart as the same. And a lot of times, too, it isn't the same planets, it's the same slots. 19 Capricorn. There might be a different planet in there, but it's this, you know, the same slot, the same degree. 19 Capricorn, uh, the sun's there. Uh, at the birth chart, Saturn might be 19 Capricorn. But the thing is, it's the same slots with respect to the background of the fixed stars. That's why you can't do it with the tropical chart. You have to use the sidereal. Okay, so it might be in a different house, but it's mm -hmm. the same. Uh, same uh, with relationship to the fixed, to the zodiac. Okay. okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to know about. You said that he doesn't refer to God very often, but what what does he say about Christ? And what is the We're going to get into that this yeah, afternoon. His, his whole mythology about because this Krishna Murti thing you mentioned is yeah. very interesting. Yeah, that's my favorite part. His his, his incredible uh, version of the Christ myth is my favorite part of his whole thing because it's it's just incredibly brilliant and. Um, uh, I don't necessarily believe it the way he puts it, uh, but he's, he's pretty amazing. Um, so why don't we just, uh, before moving into lunch, why don't we just, uh, so we can be poised right uh, after lunch for the whole creation myth thing, um, just look at how, uh, what he does to sort of retrieve the Ptolemaic system in a certain sense. Actually, I guess it's not that big a deal here. There's where they keep vanishing. Uh, is um, the, association, the associations with the, uh, the angels and the planetary spheres, uh, he sort of saves the Ptolemaic cosmos by drawing it, in a sense, horizontally. If you draw the Earth here, and you draw the, Earth, the sphere of the moon going around the Earth, and this sphere is associated with angels, and he says each one of us does indeed have a guardian angel. Um, the hierarchy of the angels is linked with our karma. And we, each have an angelic being that is linked with, as it were, sort of supervising over our karma. So the angels are involved with individual beings. 
And then, uh, so then if you go the next sphere out, if you put Mercury here, Venus here, and the Sun here, the only thing we have to do here to get the exact order of the planets as they are in the Ptolemaic system is you have to transpose Mercury and Venus. And he says there was a mix-up that took place. When the, Copernic when the Ptolemaic system shifted over to the Copernican, the names of Mercury and Venus got confused. So that he says actually the planet that's closest to the Sun isn't Mercury, it's Venus. The planet that is in between uh, you know, the Earth and Venus is actually Mercury. So uh, it's a strange little esoteric thing that he throws in there. So if you transpose those two, then you, you begin to get the order as the soul moves out toward the sort of first toward the sun, going in, catching it from this moment here. You have the archangels linked with the sphere of Mercury. Archangels, by the way, are the folk spirits. Uh, just as each angel is assigned to each individual, you have specific archangels assigned to specific nations and cultures. Mm -hmm. So each culture has a sort of indwelling totem archangel who personifies the folk spirit of that culture. And with respect to uh, Venus, you have the Archai. And the Archai, on the other hand, he calls time spirits, zeitgeist beings, are linked with the entire planetary spirit of the times. They are in charge of these sort of planetary shifts uh, that are going on all over the planet. So they have to do with the spirit of the times. Then you have the powers, like with the sun. And then you just go out, you know, and there's Venus, there's Mercury, and then, uh, what is it, Mars? Um, yeah, Mars. And then Mars is linked with the next hierarchy after the powers, the minds. And then uh, Jupiter, that's linked with the next hierarchy after the uh, minds, which are what? The domain, let's see. Okay. And then uh, Saturn right up there. Like with the sun. And then he assigns the zodiac to uh, the cherubim. Uh, but, and the seraphim he doesn't give a designation for. And so we have uh, the sun centered system there, but he's drawing it out this way so that, and, but that's the exact sequence of planets ascending this way vertically in the Ptolemaic system. Um, and that's sort of how he reconstructs this sort of horizontally, consistent with this new sort of horizontal reconstruction of the great chain of being. He throws that in there. Um, and I think he says this configuration was linked to the procession in the month of Gemini. going up from that etheric astral, the soul and the spirit, they have all the others, but they don't have the physical. And they have an individual, uh, like a consciousness for each Yes, one. yes, right. More of that will become clear as we look at the creation then. And we'll see uh, how everything evolves out of that. And it'll become clearer, uh, the powers that they have and how everything works. The key thing about, as we'll see, just to give a sort of preview of it is that Steiner's model of the great chain of being is an evolutionary model in the sense that everyone is in process of moving up into the next hierarchy. So that it turns out um, he has these uh, planetary epochs which precede the Earth epoch. He says, you know, just as we have reincarnated the Earth slash solar system, really when he says the Earth, he means the entire solar system, has had these previous incarnations as uh, before that there was old moon, before that there was old sun, and before that was old Saturn. These are earlier incarnations. And um, within each of these incarnations, the beings right now who are angels within the Earth epoch were human during the moon period. And uh, the beings who are now archangels were human during the sun period. The beings who are now archi were human during the Saturn period. So he's going to end up saying at the beginning, the human was there first, along with the, well, the spiritual beings were there first, and they bring the human in. And all the other animal kingdoms, the animal and plant kingdoms, came second. They branched off from the human, in total contradistinction to the Darwinian model. 
But this is all going on within the spiritual world, not the physical world. Uh, the Kant Laplace model doesn't come into effect until at the beginning of the Earth epoch with the actual cloud of dust and gas swirling into being. All this is going on within the astral plane. And we'll see how these angels begin spinning this out. So he says, uh, the beings who are now human within the Earth phase, in the next planetary epoch, which he calls Jupiter, will become the angelic beings. All of us who are evolving in the reincarnation process and perfecting these upper sheaths will perfect them to such a point that we won't need to incarnate physically, we'll be out of that process, and we'll be moving to the Jupiter phase, and then so on. So the whole model is evolving, and the solar system as it moves is actually this gigantic sort of vehicle toward, let's see, Jupiter is followed by Venus, and the final phase is Vulcan, so we have seven planetary epochs. And at the end of this, in the Vulcan phase, uh, you know, the solar system will be engulfed by the sun, and the whole thing will be finished, but the whole process will have been this process of transforming spiritual beings into human beings and human beings back into spiritual beings with new faculties of consciousness that were not present in the beginning. And uh, the, the goal of the moon epoch was the creation of wisdom, the goal of the earth epoch is the creation of love, and then he assigned certain goals for each of the future epochs. Um, so that's the structural skeleton uh, for the creation myth that we'll be looking at. <laughs> Um, as we'll see, he just sort of he's, he just um, says that the beings that were there to begin with were uh, the upper hierarchies. Well, all the hierarchies were there, I believe, but uh, particularly the beings that are at the top, seraphim and cherubim, are beings left over from the formation of another solar system who have gone through the perfection process. So all the, normally he only talks about our solar system, but the, really the, the gigantic Einsteinian model of all these other galaxies hadn't come in yet. Uh, but I think that he would say that uh, this is a process that's going on all through the cosmos, and each one of these solar systems spins itself into being, spins out these planets for the purpose of this spiritual process that's going on. And these beings are made, created, perfected, then they go, you know, they move to another system. And it's going on all through the entire cosmos. Um, with respect to uh, the creation mythology of Simon, we begin with the Saturn epoch. And he doesn't give any dates for this. He doesn't say when this took place or anything. He just sort of says, um, if we were to go back in time and we were to transport ourselves to the Saturn age, um, what we would see are these angelic beings using the, the middle eye, not the eye of the flesh, but the eye of the spirit. It's the only way in which these things are visible until we get to the actual Earth phase. Is um, <clears throat> You have these beings, and the first prime, uh, the, the most important being in this epoch are the thrones, or the spirits of will, and they sort of provide, uh, preside over this epoch, spirits of will, because they sacrifice their substance, and the substance that they pour out, like a silkworm spinning out its substance, turns out to be the stuff that the human body's made out of. So they sort of pour this substance out, and they stream it out into this cosmic space, and as it comes out, uh, the, the next hierarchy down, wisdom comes in, and you can sort of imagine this as this primary swirling whatever. And the spirits of wisdom then come in and stamp this thing this, with wisdom. So that you don't just have this mass of Schopenhauerian will to exist. You've got this intelligence that's stamped into it now, and they bring that in. And then we go down from the spirits of will, wisdom, to motion, and the spirits of motion descend into this and animate it. So now it turns into a kind of anima mundi. It's animate. Then we move down to the spirits of form who come in and they dice this thing up, carve it up, and end up producing these little eggs of warmth. And this is the birth of the physical body. And it just sort of has this strange little nucleus in it with this lower part that's warm. And inside, it's just purely warmth. So these are just bodies made up out of warmth. The sea pot corresponds to fire. And the only thing he says you would notice if you had, if you were transported back into the sea pot, is the sense of warmth that these little eggs are radiating. So he's sort of re retrieving the ancient myth of the birth of the cosmos from the cosmic egg. Only notice that he's individualizing it. We don't have a cosmic egg. We have all these little individual eggs. 
And then, uh, so the spirits of uh, will, wisdom, motion, form, and then personality, the spirits of personality then come in. And they are the archai, and they are the human beings in this epoch. Which is to say that the spirits of personality then descend into this thing and inhabit it. They incarnate into these little eggs, light them up, so that the, the, they are human within this insofar as they are incarnating and just sort of dwelling within these eggs of warmth. And then the, the archangels, who are the spirits of fire, sort of come in and light it up with the rudiments of the sense organs, and it starts to glow, so that you have the sort of retrieval of the myth of uh, uh, in the beginning was the light, and the light shineth in the darkness. And it starts to light up. And then uh, the angels at the bottom hierarchy come in, and they work in tandem with the cherubim to uh, create a sense of basic metabolism within this entity. And that's really it for the Saturn epoch. What happens after that's done is that everything disintegrates and goes back into this swirling cosmic abyss for a pralada. This is a Hindu term for the epoch of chaos in between world ages. The world ages are called Manvantaras, and the dark epochs in between are the Pralayas. So it all goes back in again. <clears throat> so it's almost as though the memory of the cosmos is sort of preparing itself to, for eventually to form these things as real, solid, physical structures within the physical world. But first it has to learn how to do this. So it's teaching itself how to bring forth these forms. Then we move into the moon. Uh, I'm sorry. So I'm gonna talk. One other note about Saturn before we leave it is that there's a, a very tenuous relationship between the name of each epoch and the actual planets. They don't refer to those actual planets, which actually don't come into being until the Earth phase. But what they do refer to is the fact that the size of old Saturn was as wide around as now the orbit of Saturn is. So that's what it refers to. And what happens in the, during, after the Pralaya, and everything comes back again, the whole Saturn phase is recapitulated. They run through it again. And then the next thing they do uh, are these cosmic beings come in and apply pressure to this. And the pressure that they apply densifies it and shrinks it to about the orbit of where Jupiter would be. And we'll see why this is called Sun. You can't confuse this with the Jupiter that's to come, so you don't want to call it Jupiter. But it's about the size of the orbit of Jupiter now. They compress it. And in compressing it, the warmth densifies into gas. So now you get air. So we go one element heavier than we had before with fire. So it's beginning to densify. And uh, during the sun, a very interesting phenomenon happens. Um, the human beings in this epoch now, the beings that were human in Saturn, have now moved up to the slot where now they would be angels. And the beings who are now archangels during our phase today are the, the human beings here, the archangels, spirits of fire. And they then incarnate, well, before that happens, the one, one other detail you need is the creation of the etheric body, where we descend down from the spirits of will to the spirits of wisdom. They have, in the meanwhile, they're, they're next down in the hierarchy from will, they have evolved up a notch that's enabled them now to sacrifice their substance. So they pour their substance out as wisdom, and that's the etheric body. So then the etheric body <coughs> interlaces these cosmic eggs of warmth and begins to perfuse it. And then you go down the hierarchy again, and everyone comes in and contributes what they have to contribute. The spirits of form step in, and they stabilize this thing, and so on. You go down the hierarchies to get to the archangels, the uh, spirits of fire, who then inhabit this thing. And so they're human in that sense, in that they're sort of inside these cosmic warmth eggs. But then an interesting thing happens. These warmth eggs hatch. And when they hatch, an, an etheric sun is born, lights up. These are the spirits of fire. And the whole thing is made up out of the hatching of these warm things, rapidly hatching. And these archangels, they're called the spirits of fire because they're associated with luminosity. Again, we have the light shine up in the darkness, but now it's lighting up cosmic space within the spiritual plane, not the physical. 
and the whole thing is illuminated, and this strange process goes on where this thing is uh, undergoing a kind of breathing process. And he says, when these archangels inhale, the sun goes dark, and they exhale, and it lights up again. They inhale, and it goes dark. While this is going on, I told you this got weirder and weirder. While this is going on, um, the cherubim come in with the zodiacal signs. They sort of surround this with the ecliptic. And they receive the light rays. And they kind of, when the sun goes dark, they emanate these light essences back in accordance with the animal archetypes. They go down into the core of the sun and the birth of the animal forms takes place. The group egos of the animals. They imprint this into this invisible sun. So now we have this thing getting the platonic ideas, what in Plotinus would be the noose, the cosmic mind, for all the forms that will come. So we're working, this whole thing would correspond to that phase, the, the noose, the development of the divine mind. And that's the central event in this old sun epoch. And then the whole thing finishes up with the creation at the end with uh, the, uh, at the end of Saturn, we had the creation. Not only do we have the physical body, remember, but uh, at the end of it, you had the creation of the seed uh, for the spirit body. And then this finishes up, you have the creation of the etheric body, and the etheric body finishes up with uh, the seed for the uh, spirit, the life spirit, rather. So the seed is planted for that. And that's really the work that's done in those two epochs. Now, moving along to the moon epoch, things get considerably more complicated. Within the moon epoch, we get a further densification that takes place. And this densification is, again, cosmic beings acting on this and shrinking this down to about the level of where the orbit of Mars would be. <coughs> this is a moon, old moon. So we shrink this down to about uh, where Mars would be. And um, sort of pressures. And what happens is after this recapitulation of Saturn and the recapitulation of Sun, now the next hierarchy down from will, wisdom, motion, the spirits of motion on the next down, they have evolved up now to a point where they're able to sacrifice their spiritual substance and create the astral body. So they interweave the physical and etheric body, and it sort of looks like this. It has this, almost like the shape of that, the pear shape of that uh, thing where they have the sort of lower physical body down here. And this is all etheric up here. And this schism will be important, as we'll see in a moment, between man's lower nature and his sort of higher, more spiritual nature. So the spirits of motion work on the astral body. This thing densifies to about the orbit of uh, Mars. And then what you get is the densification uh, to water. And this becomes a problem. Because water now is, can we turn up the air a little bit? Because water now is such that um, we've achieved a level of densification. A, a new substance has come in, which is so dense for these spiritual beings. We're dealing with, inc with incredibly refined spiritual beings. And they can work with the warmth, okay, they can work with the air. They can't deal with the water. So what happens is we get the first cosmic schism. And the whole thing splits. And um, you get the formation then of a, a central sun and what's called old moon orbiting around this central sun. And the beings who now comprise this central sun are the beings associated with uh, warmth and air. They've withdrawn because they don't want anything to do with this watery stuff that's emerging on this moon. What, what he's calling old moon, it's really Earth plus moon, but we'll call it moon. Um, and it's orbiting from about this where Mars is. So we have these two planets here, and this one has the warmth, air, and it also has water. But it doesn't have Earth yet. It doesn't have the solids within it. So now we have these little beings living within this. And we have this opposition between these cosmic beings who have withdrawn to the sphere of the sun, intensely spiritual beings, and we have these also these other cosmic beings who have remained behind on Earth with man. And they've rebelled now against these cosmic beings on the sun. They don't want anything to do with them. They want to live their own life. 
So what they do is try to retreat from the sun, and as they move away from the sun, they set this thing in orbit, and it starts orbiting around the sun. Their attempt to get away from the, the, uh, the higher beings, the powers that live within the sun. And meanwhile, all this is going on, and water is densifying, and the lower kingdoms are coming into being the sort of, uh, the earth is covered with this viscous, sort of watery um, stuff that's this kind of jelly-like. It's not mineral yet, but it's a kind of a cross between the plant and the mineral world. But within that are densifying these sort of plant, half plant, uh, half animal beings that are sort of densifying within that. And the human at this time is sort of half animal, half spiritual being, because that schism we mentioned now takes place within the human being, and you get this upper chalice-shaped light-filled half, and this lower fish-like amphibian half. That is a recapitulation of this schism here. The upper half is worked on by spiritual beings radiating from the sun, and they continue perfecting it, refining it, working on the astral body, which has come in now. And these lower beings that are still on the moon begin to work on man's lower nature, this amphibian fish-like nature, and they work on the sexual organs, the reproductive cycle, uh, which I like because in Kundalini Yoga, the second chakra that's associated with the genitals is linked with the moon. And so we have that sort of pulled in here. So we get this very primordial, swampy uh, state of existence. Now the other thing that happens is we get, as a result of this schism between these two planetary bodies, we get the origins of the sleeping and waking cycle, which is still, however, insufficiently uh, disentangled from the dying and uh, reviving cycle. So what happens is, um, during the daytime, the human beings sort of, they're living within these uh, uh, bodies, and as they move toward the night side of the planet, they sort of have this pictorial dream-like consciousness, because now they have astral bodies and they can dream. So they have this pictorial dreaming consciousness during the night side, away from the sun. And they begin this activity where they start to get a sense of selfhood, a sense of independence from the cosmos, a sense of independence from the cosmic beings. But then when the planet revolves around onto the day side, toward the sun, then the astral body pulls out of these physical bodies and sort of unites itself with the cosmic sun beings and becomes saturated with uh, the higher forces of the higher beings that live within the sun. Then it uh, spins around back toward the, uh, toward the night side. These beings come back in and inhabit their bodies again. So you get this sort of miniaturization of sleeping, waking, and dying, and reviving. And this whole process is going on. And that's the primary thing that happens until these two planetary bodies then fuse back together again. And when they fuse back together, the, the higher beings that are working in the sun can now work upon the human faculties in a way that's unhindered. They don't have to worry about um, these other substances or these other beings who have revolted against them. And so they reunify. The schism between the upper and the lower human reunites, and the whole thing goes back into the cosmic abyss. And that's old uh, moon. Then we begin to move into old Earth, or let's say the Earth phase itself which then is subdivided into four phases that recapitulate the main events within these phases. <clears throat> you have the Hilarion Epoch, in which the events of Saturn are more or less recapitulated. There's a sort of cosmic fiery substance, and there are these little warmth eggs jittering within this cosmic fiery substance. It goes through that cycle, fire, then we move into the Hyperborean Age. And then we get, you know, you have the physical body, then the etheric body comes in, fire, the densification from fire to air, and so forth, and we move through close to the end of the Hyperborean Age, when once again the separation of the sun from the moon takes place. And once again, these spiritual beings withdraw into the sun, and other spiritual beings remain behind with man on the earth, helping man to try to develop. But as you get the recapitulation of the sleep-wake cycle, you get this sort of weird inversion of what took place before, where during the daytime now, human beings are united with their body. But during the nighttime, they leave it. And when they return to the body in the daytime, what they find is that these things are hardening. Because as these elements are densifying, and when we're in the Earth phase, you get the water 
and then uh, or, or the water, and then finally we're moving into the phase of solids. Everything is cooling off and hardening. And the physical body, every time these beings descend back down into the physical body the next morning, they're harder. They're, they're, they're calcifying. And then they start withdrawing. They decide that they can't inhabit these bodies, so they start withdrawing to these other planets. And then the sort of contemplage model comes in, takes place, and we get the swirling cloud where these planets start breaking off. And the reason that they break off is because these human beings can't incarnate in these bodies anymore, so they have to create these other outer planets to take up their abode. So they each withdraw to these planets, along with the spiritual beings from the various hierarchies. And they sort of wait out there. But meanwhile, there's this problem now of the calcification of the human body. The thing is basically hardening and turning towards stone, and would have turned towards stone. Everything is hardening on the Earth, were it not for, then, the separation of the moon from the Earth. So the moon and the cosmic beings that are associated with the moon now pull out of the Earth. It's a sort of cosmic crisis. And they take with them all the toxic, poisonous elements and the calcifying elements that are making this thing harden too fast and they pull it off with them. And Yahweh is one of the beings who lives within the moon, one of the moon beings. The Christ being lives within the sun. And both beings are working down on man, working on him, helping him to. But now what happens is all these hard elements have withdrawn. Everything suddenly gets softer again. Now these beings start descending down from the planets and they immediately start taking up their abode within these human physical bodies, which still aren't technically solid yet, just more solid than they were over here. And so there's this process where human beings are now ready to incarnate within the Earth, but now there's a new problem because certain beings who have broken off as rebellious spirits from the sun now find out about what's going on with this human process and they begin to infect the astral body. These are the Luciferic spirits. Lucifer is a, is a light being. And they break in and begin to infect the human astral body. Now remember, the Luciferic spirits tempt man towards spiritual inflation, tempt him toward believing that he is a god and can be just become a god. And then he has no need to go through the incarnation process or deal with the realm of matter at all. So now human beings, because their astral and etheric bodies are becoming polluted through possession by these divine beings, now have to begin the reincarnation process. Because these sheaths have to be purged out now through repeated lifetimes. Uh, see, there's, like I said, everything that's in the New Age, you can find in Steiner, this idea of demonic possession. There's a precedent for it right in there. These beings are infecting the astral body. They come in through the astral plane, and they can and do take possession of human beings. They get into the astral body and pollute it. Um, and by the way, when the, uh, when the moon had withdrawn, you also have uh, the separation into the sexes, you know, the sort of male and female sexes separate. Up to this point, humans had been androgynous and had reproduced by sort of asexual, just cloning themselves. But now you have sexual dimorphism coming in, and you get this idea of the next generations not being clones, and that introduces a new kind of diversity for the reincarnation process to take advantage of, to begin this process of purging out these demonic beings from the astral and etheric bodies. And so that whole process begins. And then um, this now, have, we've moved into, I jumped ahead, we've moved into the Lemurian epoch, which is the third Earth epoch. And all of this, this is sort of Steiner's version of the fall, when the moon pulls out the schism into the sexes, and Lucifer corresponds to the temptation in the garden, the Luciferic beings come in, take the vision of man's astral body, and now the reincarnation process is set is set moving. I'm leaving out lots and lots of information here. This is actually unbelievably complex. This is all I've actually been able to remember from uh, this myth. That's all. That's all. <laughs> you should try try reading outline of a, try reading outline of occult science. I had to read it something like five times. And then. Um, these Lemurian beings are these sort of giants. This corresponds to the giants in the Genesis 6, the Nephilim, uh, the offspring of the human and Nephilim. Those are these sort of gigantic beings which have yet to solidify. And for one reason or another, they do themselves in, and there's a catastrophe. Le uh, the continent of Lemuria sinks, and then you move into the Atlantis period. So Steiner uh, is still coming out of this whole age in the 19th century when people still believe in the possibility of Atlantis. And it still do. I mean, it still gets 
this new age myth still gets recycled. And so we have the Atlanteans. And now what we begin to get is the solidification of the human form. It starts to solidify and resemble what it resembles today somewhat. The etheric body uh, begins to retract and slowly pulls in and becomes about coterminous with the actual physical body so that the two have about the same uh, shape. And then with respect to the Atlanteans, he says they had, they had these incredible clairvoyant abilities where they could still commune with the gods. And these avatars would descend down from the cosmic planet. Would, they, would take, they would descend down as avatars, take on human form, and teach them all the various arts, just like the Nephilim in Genesis 6. They would teach them everything, the arts of civilization. And the Atlanteans had incredible memories. They weren't very intellectual. They didn't have intellectual capacities, but they had incredible memory. And they had clairvoyant abilities where they could still see that if they were speaking with an avatar, they knew that it was an avatar before them, not just a human. And so they were working with all of this. And they had a certain kind of technology, Steiner says, where, you know, in our technology, it's based on extraction of sort of mineral sources from the earth. Their technology was based on uh, the etheric world of the plants. And they had a sort of plant technology. I'm not sure how it worked, but he just says they have this plant technology. And um, then they go through their cycle and they do themselves in. Uh, a flood or something happens. I think it's a flood. It's a volcano that destroys Limor and then a flood that wipes out Atlantis. But before this has happened, certain uh, initiates within Atlantis have, know that this flood is coming. And there are these seven schools within Atlantis that are called oracles. And each one is the school corresponding to a particular planet, corresponding to the initiation into the mysteries of each one of the seven planets. And um, a leader appears among them named Manu. And so this is the old Hindu uh, legendary sage. And he appears among them. And he selects one from each of these schools, one of the best, to take with him. But it turns out that these individuals, the Atlanteans are already beginning to lose their clairvoyant abilities to communicate easily with the gods as they approach the end of their culture cycle. And these individuals um, aren't very clairvoyant, but they have good intellects, and they'll need it in the next stage. So um, what happens is that Manu goes to this sort of head oracle of each of these schools, and he takes copies of the etheric bodies from each one of these. Now Steiner has developed something that he calls spiritual economy. And it turns out that the reincarnation process isn't quite so simple either. The spiritual world is such that when certain etheric bodies or astral bodies have been developed, Steiner has developed something that he calls spiritual economy. And it turns out that the reincarnation process isn't quite so simple either. The spiritual world is such that when certain etheric bodies or astral bodies have been developed and worked upon, and individuals have worked upon them and developed and really created something, they're stored up within the astral world. They're not just dispensed with. And copies can be made of them. So copies are made of the etheric bodies of each of these initiates, and sort of Manu takes this group with him, and it's almost like uh, giving them, I suppose, a communion meal. Somehow he gets these etheric bodies into them. Steiner's very vague about a lot of these details. They get these etheric bodies into them and suddenly they have clairvoyant abilities. Now they can see into the astral plane and they have an intellect, which is something that the Atlanteans did not have. And um, just as an aside, Steiner, for example, says uh, uh, that uh, the etheric body of Zoroaster was inherited by Hermes, the founder of the Egyptian civilization, whereas Moses inherited the astral body of Zoroaster. The etheric body has to do with being able to see that's the other way around, actually. Moses inherited the etheric body because the etheric body enables you to see into the clairvoyant world. And Moses' writing in the book of Genesis was supposedly his ability to use the etheric body of Zoroaster to see into the spiritual world, whereas uh, there was a more technological emphasis with Hermes and the Egyptian civilization, and the astral body uh, apparently stores up a more sort of technical uh, basis. And he also says Copernicus inherited Nicholas of Cusa's etheric body because Nicholas of Cusa had an early intuition of the heliocentric solar system before Copernicus did, about a century before. Nobody's sure how he came by it, but uh, Steiner says it was because he inherited it. So, as in the Buddhist tradition, the subtle body can split up and parts of it can go to other individuals if they have been highly developed. And he also says that if an individual, this is crucial to his theory of the incarnation, if an individual has within him the presence of one of these divine beings, an avatar, it enables copies to be made of that person's etheric body. And he says that Shem, for example, the ancestor of the Hebrews, 
had within him an avatar that enabled him copies of his etheric body to be distributed to all the Hebrews, and so through the transmission of the bloodline. And so they've all sort of received the copies of the etheric body of Shem. But Christ is an avatar who does something different. We'll look at that uh, in a bit here. So anyhow, the gist of it is that uh, this migration of people moves from about the area of Ireland, somewhere in there, and they move east. And they establish the foundations for the first post-Atlantean epoch. And of course, there are seven of those. And um, the first post-Atlantean epoch is the Hindu culture cycle. And now he's specific about dates. He says the Atlantean catastrophe happened in 7227 BC. And that's about coterminous with the birth of the prehistoric Indian civilization. Now he says this is not the Hindu civilization that we think of. It's a prehistoric one. It's the early, early rudiments of Indian civilization, which begins to come in in 7227 BC and lasts until 5067 BC. And the task of the Hindu civilization, now the Atlanteans, notice, have developed the physical body. They've solidified it. But now the etheric body has to be developed within the human species. So the, the task of the Hindus was to develop this etheric body. They never really developed the astral body because Steiner says the reason why there's such an emphasis in Indian mysticism on uh, quelling the passions and desires and getting rid of all of that is the Hindus never really got a sense of the astral body, but the etheric body was something that they got. And they were able to see into the etheric world, and they saw the whole outer world as maya, as illusion, as something that was essentially not real. So the outer world was not real for them. And then the Hindu civilization gets off and going, uh, and it lasts for that period. Then we move to the second post-Atlantean culture epoch, which is the Persian. And again, we've got these absurdly ancient prehistoric dates but the dates that he gives are 5067 BC for the Persian, going down to uh, 2907 BC. And you can see they're about 2,000 years each, and that'll be significant for the Platonic month. Um, 5067 to 2907. And now he says uh, the special mission of the Persian peoples was to bring in a development of the astral body. And this is why in Persian dualism, now remember that. Uh, the emphasis on Brahman in India uh, is kind of emphasis on the one. We said that that was about equivalent to Plotinus' idea of the one. And Sainz says the Hindu epoch, in a certain sense, links back to old sun, before there were any planetary schisms, before the sun and the moon split into two planetary bodies. So that kind of, the Hindus are sort of in resonance with old sun, with that single sun that the archangels sort of lit up, and that their emphasis on the oneness is in resonance with that. Then he says that the Persian mythology of the separation, you know, you have this, this sort of, um, you have the god of light, Ahura Mazda, and then Araman is the god of darkness. And that split between darkness and light, between matter down here and the spiritual world up above, is, Steiner says, a recapitulation of old moon, of the separation on old moon between sun and uh, the earth moon body. And remember, we saw the, the dualism between the more spiritual in the sun and the more dense and material on the earth plus moon during old moon. So they sort of tapped into this. Zoroaster is the primary prophet here. And uh, he evolves this religion. They develop the astral body. Remember, the astral body has to do with passions and desires. And um, in a certain sense, Steiner's dates I don't think are very good ones. But in a certain sense, the Persian civilization represents an improvement over the Hindus, but also a rejection of India. I mean, if you go from uh, the, the real dates for India, classically anyway, are 1500 BC, thereabouts, you can push it back to Mohenjo-Daro, to the prehistoric period of about 2500 BC. Uh, but the, with the Aryans coming in and building the caste system and all that, that all begins about 1500 BC. Uh, and the Persians normally date from about 1000 BC, the academic dates for Persia. And there's a debate about whether Zoroaster lived 1,000 B.C. or whether he lived 500 B.C. But I think the evidence speaks for 1,000 B.C. because the Gathas, which are the, the Zoroastrian sacred texts, are very similar in their language to Sanskrit. So the two can't have been very, that far apart, 500 B.C. Hindu idea of going off into the forest alone and practicing meditation is bunk. 
That's not something that should be done. What you need to be interested in is society and helping to improve society in its attempt at a restoration of the good. There has been this cosmic fall, the separation of light from darkness, and it is the task of us as individuals to participate within the ethical world of what Zoroaster says is the good, you know, following right conduct, right this, right that, following those rules, and eschewing that whole Hindu idea of t turning away from society. So you can already see the West is coming in here, in its uh, sort of rejection of these. Sort of, even geographically, there's the dividing line between India and Persia there. And um, the other thing about, uh, is there's an intentional inversion, because what are uh, Asuras in India becomes, those are the devils, becomes Ahura Mazda, the god of light, the sun god. And Steiner says that the Zoroastrian worship of the sun god was really the Christ being that they were worshiping. The Christ being is the sun god, and cultures which worship sun gods were actually recognizing the Christ being. And divas, which are the Hindu divinities, are now devils in this system. The language has been intentionally inverted to sort of invert the value systems. So the Persians explicitly are rejecting the Hindu worldview. Uh, so in a certain sense, Steiner's got, uh, has got this right uh, from that uh, perspective. Then we get into the uh, Egyptian civilization, which is the third post-Atlantean epoch. And of course, the Egyptian civilization, as we know, is much older than the Hindu and so much of what we know about India can be documented as having been originated in Egypt, so that Egypt should be first. But even before Egypt, of course, we ought to have Sumer. There's a lot that the Egyptians have borrowed from the Sumerians, but nobody knew about the Sumerians yet. And uh, so we have uh, the Egypto-Chaldean civilization coming in here at uh, 2907 BC, which is about right, actually, 3000 BC for the Egyptian civilization. That date's about correct. And that goes, uh, what is my date for that? 747 BC. So that's the Egyptian civilization. And then he says uh, that the trinity of Osiris, Horus, and Isis are a linkage back to the Lemurian epoch when you had the separation of the moon <coughs> from the earth. And you already had, remember, the separation in the old moon epoch of the earth from the moon, which the Persians were recapitulating. So the Egyptians are in resonance with this threefold, these three planetary, uh, this trifold model that dates from the period of uh, the Lemurian epoch that we saw. And to the Egyptians, the Egyptians and the Chaldeans became interested in astrology now because um, Steiner says the cosmos wasn't something unreal to them at all. When they looked up at the heavens, they saw the stars as a revelation, and men's destiny on earth uh, was something that could be seen as a cosmic mirror, as above, so below. And the lower world was a mirror of the upper world, and it was very real to them. So there's a gradual way in which, as we move through these civilizations, there's a gradual fall away from the spiritual world. Man is slowly, civilization by civilization, losing the ability to connect easily with the world of the gods and the divine, but is simultaneously developing abilities that gradually lead to mastery over the physical plane. The Egyptians have certain technological abilities that neither the Persians nor the Hindus had. So they have, but on the other hand, it's worth noting that the way in which the Egyptian society worked was the entire society was a gigantic living necropolis. For the Egyptians, the outer world was the primary thing. They really were in touch with the whole idea of the afterlife and the astral plane. And as we'll see in Spangler, the primary idea of Egyptian civilization is this idea of the soul's judgment at the moment of death. So Osiris becomes this god who becomes lord of the astral plane, but he doesn't conquer the physical plane the way Christ does when sort of Christ is resurrected and becomes master of all the worlds. But Osiris becomes the lord of the dead and the lord of the astral plane. So that's the Egypto-Chaldean civilization. And then finally we get to the fourth post-Atlantean epoch, which is the Greco-Roman epoch. Now if we draw this out in the shape of a V, and we put the first epoch here, the Hindu, and then the second here, 
Persian, and uh, the third, the Egyptian. Then we have the Greco-Roman down here as the sort of nadir of this fall away from the spiritual world. We are right here, the fifth post-Atlantean epoch. That's us. There will be a sixth, which will actually be the Russians, according to both Spangler and Steiner agree that the future belongs to Russia. Russia will be the next great civilization cycle. And I think it's interesting that both men agreed on that, um, but probably didn't agree. Spangler would have hated Steiner's writings. And I know Steiner read Spangler, but probably didn't think much of him. And the seventh will belong to a reborn American culture. And um, the dates for these just go, you know, every 2,000 years. So that we have uh, 747 BC for the Greco-Roman period going up to 1413 AD. Our period begins 1413 AD and goes up to 3573, I think. What do you mean by our period? Please? This is the period of the consciousness soul. This, uh, in terms of our astral bodies, we had uh, your Hindus, etheric, Persian was astral, remember? The Egyptian developed the uh, sentient soul. That's what I forgot to mention. The sentient soul, the Egyptian and Sumerian cultures can be regarded as sort of developing this rich, sensuous imagery. They didn't really have an intellectual tradition per se, but they did have this wonderful sense of the play of myth. And, um, and this wonderfully sort of pictographic, right brain, lovely, sensuous imagery. They had the hieroglyphic script. Um, but in the Greco-Roman epoch, which also includes the Hebrews, you have the development of the alphabet now, which is a new kind of abstraction. So this is what Steiner calls the intellectual soul, developed, is first developed by the Greeks and the Hebrews, which date from this epoch as well. And this is our age here. Now we're moving on to the consciousness soul, which, remember, had to do with freedom and the development of the individual. This will also, in some sense, the Russians will develop spirit self-consciousness, and the Americans, uh, the, the later American, will come long after us into some sort of uh, development of the life spirit consciousness. But for right now, before we move into that, let's concentrate for a second on the Greco-Roman, 747 BC to 1413 AD, the development of the intellectual soul. And really, in many ways, uh, the Greeks did develop the intellect, and I think the alphabet had a lot to do with it. The alphabet enables a new kind of abstract thinking, which is totally divorced from pictorial thinking. In the hieroglyphic script, you're still bound to sensuous imagery. Um, but with the alphabet, you enter a new world of abstraction, and it enables philosophy to come in. Now you have philosophical thinking. And, but the Greeks are sort of moving away from the world of the gods. They're in it for a while, but once you get into about the fourth century BC, they start losing the ability to connect with the world of the gods. And they start developing philosophy. You know, Plato and Aristotle come in. Uh, meanwhile, the culture's falling apart. And um, so all of this then develops this e epoch of the intellectual soul. But man has fallen as far as he possibly can at this point from contact with the spiritual world by the time you get to the Roman period. And the Romans were just you know, decadent, utterly decadent, steeped in a materialistic vision. They laughed at the gods. The time of uh, the decline of the Roman uh, Republic and the rise of the empire, uh, when the time of the Christ being came in, was the period that was associated with this uh, total materialism, this saturation with materialism. And then right into the midst of this, then, comes the Christ being. As, in a sense, our rescue from this fall and this loss of contact with spiritual beings. So now what we want to do is take a look at Steiner's theory of the uh, incarnation of Christ. Which I think is certainly one of the most interesting and unique theories that I've come across uh, describing the uh, incarnation of Christ. The starting point of this is sort of... <clears throat> Now remember that Christ is the sort of, just to give a step back for a second and give an overview, what, what does Steiner mean uh, by the incarnation of Christ? Christ is this being living on the sun, a sort of central sun being, who came down at this moment in history just as Jesus was turning 30, he was on his Sabbath return, 
And the, but the Christ is a separate being, according to Steiner. The Christ is this avatar that descended down into Jesus at the moment that he was baptized by John the Baptist, so that that little dove that you always see in those representations represents the descent of the Christ being, that descended into him, took up residence for three years, did all the deeds and miracles that we've come to associate with the Gospels, and then did not leave. But when the crucifixion took place, the sort of blood leaked out, and Steiner has this weird theory that the blood communicates the ego. So the ego of the Christ being saturates into the earth and actually transubstantiates the entire earth. He said if you were to sort of step outside the solar system and you could see this event happening with spiritual vision, what you would see is, you know, the, the earth has a sort of aura about it. And at the moment of this blood leaking into the earth, you would have seen this aura change color. So in a sense, what he's done is he's taken the Catholic mass of the transubstantiation of the bread and wine and magnified it into a planetary scale transubstantiation. So he's got the Christ descending down into Earth, where he's been ever since, in the Earth's etheric body and actually changing the structure of Earth's etheric body and enabling new possibilities for human spiritual development that were not available up to this point. We'll get into those momentarily. But that's the sort of cosmological idea that he has here, this transubstantiation of the earth um, by the Christ being. So now just sort of looking at Steiner's vision of the Gospels. If you go to the Gospels, and you go to the Luke Gospel and the Matthew Gospel, you've got these two infancy narratives there. And the infancy narratives not only leave out things that the other one leaves out, but they're completely contradictory. If you look at... Um, Let's say we have uh, Matthew here, and these are the only two that have infancy narratives. Uh, Mark doesn't have an infancy narrative, but John doesn't. Mark is the oldest, John is the most recent. Uh, I think they were written in the order of Mark. Um, these two are about the same time, and then John was written. Um, but uh, the infancy narrative in Matthew, for example, the Annunciation of Gabriel descends and announces to Joseph. The Annunciation in Luke descends and announces to Mary. Um, you have the Magi who have gone wandering. Uh, they've gone looking at the star, wandering like Buddhist monks looking for the reincarnated master. And uh, that's in Matthew, but it's not in Luke. What you get in Luke is the presentation of the Christ child and the shepherds in the manger. And also in Matthew, you get this exodus back into Egypt. That's not, there's no exodus into Egypt in the Luke infancy narrative whatsoever. And not only that, but the clincher is that in the, the genealogy of the Matthew Gospel is different from the genealogy of the Christ child. Matthew gives a genealogy that's about identical up to David, but then David has two sons. Well, at least two. He may have had more. Uh, but uh, the Matthew Gospel traces it through Solomon, the descent of the Jesus child through Solomon. Solomon was the uh, sort of warrior king. David had another son named Nathan, and the Luke Gospel traces the genealogy through Nathan, who was the priest king, or rather the priestly version. Now this is interesting. What Steiner's going to end up saying is there were two different Jesus children. And um, there is a precedent for this idea. It seems rather bizarre until you recall that in fact, when the, uh, the uh, Nagamite Library was dug up, and the writings about the Essenes were dug up, they expected two messiahs to come. Not one. The Essenes thought that there would be a priestly messiah who would come, and there would be a warrior messiah who would come. So this idea of the expectation of a dual messiah does have historical precedent. And so Steiner's theory doesn't seem quite as bizarre in light of that uh, recent discovery, you know, a few decades ago. Um, so he so ends up saying there are two Jesus children. Two, uh, the odd thing is that, you know, you have two Josephs and two Marys. Um, but leaving that aside, um, you have the births don't take place at the same time, though. They're, they're separated by about a year. Um, so you have the sort of Solomon Jesus and the Nathan Jesus. And the other thing is that in the Luke Gospel, the Nathan Jesus, at about the age of 12, suddenly shows up. You know, the parents lose him. They're probably shopping uh, in the mall. And uh, they come back and they find him, you know, where's little Jesus? And there he is in the temple instructing everyone, giving them these lessons, and they're shocked. They're like, what the hell is going on here? We, this isn't the Jesus boy we know. How did he suddenly get so smart? 
Well, what we're going to find is he got so smart because, uh, before we get to that, Zarathustra has reincarnated, his ego has reincarnated into the Jesus Solomon. So, um, and that's what led the Magi there. They were looking for the reincarnation of Zoroaster, their master, and that's what led them to this. Um, so you have that. Then you have um, the ego of the Jesus boy, the, de the name of Jesus boy, had never before appeared on the earth and was a bit awkward and would have been sort of regarded as uh, retarded or a handicapped child. Um, very warm, loving being. However, his astral body had been inherited from the Buddha. And the Buddha's historical mission, according to Steiner, was to develop a sense of compassion and love through a series of incarnations, perfecting his astral and etheric bodies until he got it and then broke from the reincarnation cycle and no longer had to reincarnate. But his astral body was, as we've seen by the principle of spiritual economy, these bodies can separately reincarnate into others. The Jesus child had this warm, loving, Buddhistic nature about him, whereas this knowledge nature is inherited by the Solomon Jesus child. Then he says, right about the age of 12, uh, when, when the boy was 12, the ego of the Zarathustra being transmigrated into the ego of the Nathan boy, displacing that ego, and I'm not sure what happens to it, but then the Zoroastrian being is in here so that we have in a sense a fusion of Buddhism and Zoroastrianism. Mani attempted this. So Steiner's picking up, uh, remember the prophet Mani in the third century AD attempted this check. He was at the end development of Gnosticism, and his goal was to synthesize Buddhism, Zoroastrianism, and Christianity. Steiner, in a sense, is picking up from where Mani left off. Now, what happens to this other Jesus boy is he dies. And um, one of the parents dies. I think it's the, uh, the father had already long since died. And this Mary goes over here to live with this family whose mother has died. So that Mary is dead. And... Um, all of Jesus' brothers and sisters, and he's got seven of them, he, there are four brothers and two sisters, were all born to this family. But in this one, uh, the Jesus boy was a loner. They all go to live with their mother over here and um, take up residence with the other Joseph. So that we get this gap then from about the period of 12 until he's 30. And um, Sire in the fifth gospel tells about him wandering around amongst the Essenes, trying to learn from the Essenes. He's hanging out with them. He's trying to learn. Uh, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, Buddha going out and hanging out with the yogis in the forest, and then he realizes this isn't the way to elimination. You don't want to just reject everything in the physical world. Um, he realizes that the way of the Essenes is not for him. He doesn't want it. So he goes wandering, and he finds John the Baptist. John the Baptist is the reincarnation of Elijah, and this is traditional. This is in the Steiner Bizarrism. Um, John the Baptist was thought by the Hebrews to be the reincarnation of Elijah. Uh, if you read them in the Bible, John is dressed identical. It's thought by some that John may have been an Essene, but the Essenes wore white garments, and John the Baptist wore uh, sort of leather skin or camel skin, um, exactly what Elijah is said to have worn. So we have John the Baptist. And then uh, Steiner says, yes, and then the bizarre Steinerism comes in where he says, uh, John the Baptist was reborn as Raphael, the painter, and then subsequently reincarnated as the poet Novalis. That I want to do more research on. There's a whole book about that. It's interesting. Um, so that's that individuality. But meanwhile, uh, Christ goes, and, uh, rather the Jesus person, goes and is sort of taking lessons from John the Baptist, who's teaching him about spirituality. And then finally, uh, there comes the moment on his Saturn return, at the age of 30, when John baptizes him, and the Essenes, uh, he, uh, Steiner says John the Baptist was once an Essene, also like Christ, but departed from them. The Essenes practiced baptism, and that's where he got that uh, from them. And then he baptizes Christ, and at that, uh, John, Jesus, and at that moment, the Christ being descends down from the Son to take up residence within this highly evolved individuality. This is why the Christ being is so important to Steiner, because he's composed out of all these beings who have traveled through the history of the cosmos, perfecting and reincarnating themselves and fusing together. And this is why the Christ being for him was absolutely central and uh, could never reincarnate again. 
And he was only on Earth for the period of three years and then uh, dissolved into the Earth's etheric body, where he is now. Now, he says that the Christ being is the bringer of the principle of true, individu true individuality, the I am. You remember that passage in the Bible where uh, Moses approaches the burning bush and the, uh, Moses says, who are you? And the burning bush says, I am the I am. Well, Snyder says something this makes sense now when you think about this, because what Moses was communing with there was the Christ being. And the Christ being is the ego who comes down in and teaches individuals how to be true individuals and not rely on their groups. Now there's a break from the old Hebraic notion of thinking of yourself as a member of a tribal entity. But John the Baptist was the forerunner because he was out alone in the wilderness developing his individuality, and the Christ is the being who comes in and teaches us how to be true individualities, how to have the strength to be individuals on our own, as our, you know, our own selves, without having to take on this sort of tribal clan group identity. So he represents something new in the spirit of evolution in that sense. He also sort of, dis in the sort of harrowing of hell, he sort of descends down into the underworld and lights it up because the spiritual world had darkened for the Greeks. Remember, it was very much still lit up for the Egyptians, but for the Greeks, uh, all the references to the underworld are very dark. They didn't like it. It creeped them out. And they always say, you know, there are these twittering shades and you don't want to go down into the underworld. They, they had just lost contact with the spiritual, the, the underworld, the astral world. But Christ in the harrowing of hell goes down into it and lights it back up again so that new possibilities are enabled for those individuals who are willing to bring into themselves the Christ impulse and begin this process of spiritual illumination through the perfection of the astral body and the etheric body and the ego and so forth. And um, that's Steiner's rather uh, elaborate mythology of the uh, incarnation of the Christ. I'm amazed that I remembered most of it. Fascinating. Does anyone else accept this theory? No, nobody outside of Anthropos. It's totally unique, right? Yes. So this is why he didn't accept Krishna Mukti as me. Exactly right. Yes. But what about the Jesus story? How he's speaking about the Christ being. Right. But then there is the, the Jesus, or that, that gets, I suppose, that transforms once the Christ being comes into the I think so, yes. I think so. But right. the Jesus was the uh, Zoroaster, the Jesus right. ego you're talking about. Well, yeah. Which ego are we talking about? The, the Nathan Boy the backward ego, is, which had been displaced into the astral plane right, once right. Zoroaster transmigrates into right. it. And then you have that, and then when the Christ being comes down into the Zoroaster, you have a feeling that that gets displaced in turn into the astral world. And then you just have this sort of Christ being. So that's that mythology. And then just to finish up with Steiner, uh, we're just about done here, is just uh, the epoch of the consciousness soul then, which began in 1413 AD, represented something new with respect to the fact that Christ has been now but part of the earth, the spirit of the earth, as it were, in all those intervening centuries. And the development of Christianity over those centuries actually recapitulates the development of it from uh, etheric to astral to physical. But um, in 1413, men began to have a new style of thinking in Northern Europe where prior to this time, when individuals had thoughts, they didn't think that they originated the thoughts. They thought that divine beings had come down into them and inspired them with these thoughts. And um, Sander says that about 1413, what happens is, as you move into this new epoch of northern European civilization, uh, men began to think their own thoughts and began to divorce themselves once again from the spiritual world and develop their own thoughts and begin to have use the consciousness soul, which has to do with the will, to apply it to the sensory world to attain mastery over it through all of this de development of technology that we've had. So the whole epoch of the consciousness soul has been this dedicated to this d total divorce from the spiritual world. We've forgotten about the gods, but in the meantime, we've used our concept of individuality uh, and developed it, and have, now we have the myth of respect for the individual, uh, which is something quite unique in the West, and now we have this idea of mastery over the physical world with these machines, but now, of course, as everyone knows, that's flipping into a problem with all these ecological problems. 
But uh, Steiner said that the next, um, the, the event, remember, that I made reference to about the Archangel Michael brings us to our sort of culminating point. Steiner says that in about 1879, there was a war in heaven, let's say in the astral plane, between the Archangel Michael and these other Aramonic beings who were expelled from the astral plane, wound up wandering on earth looking to possess the souls of men, and did so, and led to the kind of uh, outbreak of World War I that started the madness of the 20th century. But the Archangel Michael, meanwhile, ascended from the level of an archive to, or ascended from the level of an archangel to an archive, in other words, became a time spirit, and in doing that, also descended down into the Earth's etheric body. And in doing so, the second thousand years of the epoch of the consciousness soul will be now the beginning of the, what Steiner calls the Michaelic Age, which is the beginning now of the turning back to the spiritual world with Michael is a personification of, he's the archangel who rules over intelligence. And this incredible intellectual mind that we've developed in Northern Europe has got to be kept. We can't just throw it in the garbage. And it has to be brought into unity with the spiritual world. So it is the mission of the Archangel Michael to descend down into us and help us to reconnect back to the spiritual world without losing our sense of self-awareness, without losing our sense of true individuality and the sense of clear thinking. So this represents the enunciation of a new age, this Michaelic age. And uh, Steiner, Steiner saw this as rep representing the next development uh, in the history of uh, uh, the rest of the consciousness soul, which will go on to 3573. Uh, and um, just one final note about that is that um, those epochs that go every 2,000 years are correlated with the platonic months that have to do with the precession of, of the equinoxes, but they overlap, they stride. Uh, in other words, you have you know, Cancer, the month of Cancer being, uh, you know, everybody calibrates it a little bit differently, but if you say 8,000 to 6,000, um, and we had the Hindus come in, uh, a Hindu culture epoch uh, dates from 72 to 27, BC to, uh, what did I say, what was it, 5067. You can see how it overlaps with both Cancer and Gemini. If you, if you round it out, it's about 6,000 to 4,000. So that it has a sort of uh, 7,000, picks up the last 1,000 years of the Cancer Epoch, and 5,000 moves into the first 1,000 years of the Gemini Epoch. So his cultural epochs straddle each of these platonic months, so that each one of those cultures has sort of one foot in both of these ages as you go along the way. So he was very conscious about this because individuals reincarnate every, uh, you know, every thousand years, two thousand years for bisexual, bisexuality, and it's linked in with this procession of the equinoxes. And then he has these sub epochs that are linked with archangels, uh, the age of the archangel Michael, which will last about three hundred and seventy years or so, was preceded by the age of the archangel Gabriel. Um, which began right around 1500. And Gabriel uh, is the archangel that's associated with births and heredity. And there's an awful lot of Annunciation paintings done right in this time period, uh, 14, between 1400 and 1500, of the archangel Gabriel announcing to uh, the Virgin uh, the Annunciation of the birth of uh, Christ. There's a lot of them in there. and. Um, then he has uh, seven of these angels linking every 300 years backward. Um, they become sort of regent of these sub-epochs every 300 years. So that the previous Michael Age uh, would have been about the period of uh, uh, Alexander the Great and Aristotle and that whole period of cosmopolitanism so that our age then is in resonance with the great cosmopolitanism of that age, the age of uh, the, the uh, Hellenistic period of the Greeks. So that brings everything about uh, full circle to where I want it to be um, with respect to Steiner. And that gives you a sense of the enormity and, and complexity of his model. It's, it's absolutely gigantic. And how anybody could have come up with this, I, I just have no idea.